There, try again. Now it's on. Is it on? Yes, it's on. So it was a good timing to start. There was a quiet, kind of natural quieting down. Everybody was expecting this to start. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you to this 11th European Forum of Rights of Child. And this year we will focus our attention entirely to children deprived of liberty. This afternoon you can speak and listen to English, French, German, Greek, Italian, Spanish and Hungarian. Some of you were here in this room um, among the 150 participants at the first European Forum on uh, the Rights of the, the Child, which was held um, uh, in Berlin back to uh, 2007, so not in this room, but another room. Uh, this year, you are 300 participants from 28 member states of the EU, as well as Iceland, Norway, Switzerland, Albania, Bosnia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Kosovo, Montenegro, Serbia, and the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. And you represent a range of national authorities from justice to social affairs, health and migration. You may be a prosecutor or a judge, a border guard or a police officer, a social worker, a national coordinator for missing children, a probation officer or someone working in a prison or juvenile detention center. You may represent national managing authorities for EU funds. Many of you work in the field while others at policy and decision making levels. As well as national authorities you represent among others civil society, international organizations, ombudspersons for children, academia and EU institutions. And I would like to warmly thank the 60 chairs, speakers and panelists who are contributing to the success of these two days. And I would like to thank you especially young speakers who will tell us about your own experience, experience and deprivation of liberty. Your voice will be heard. Many others whose names are not in the program generously contributed to the participation of the forum, to preparation of the forum and your commitment and participation are much appreciated. Today, the plenary sessions will address EU and international commitments on children deprived of liberty with an overall focus on alternatives to detention. Tomorrow morning, to set the scene, we will start with a keynote address by Renate Winter, the chair of the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, and with personal testimonies from young people. Then we will have more in-depth discussions with four parallel sessions on different aspects. Children in conflict with law, detention of children in the context of migration, children in institutions, children of parents in prison. We will finally reconvene in plenary for concluding remarks. Some 170 of you have participated in the side event yesterday and this morning and I encourage you, all of you, to take forward those discussions into the forum. Uh, as I said on this occasion last year, I would ask all of you to take a child's rights approach. Always think of the individual children concerned. Promote rights-based alternatives to deprivation of liberty in all settings, guided at all times by an ethic of care. This forum uh, should lead to a clear follow-up actions by everyone in this room, ultimately contributing to better outcomes for children concerned. I look forward to expert discussions and practical and useful outcomes. I invite you to make the best possible use of the networking opportunities this gathering offers. Please talk to people you would normally not have the opportunity to talk to and continue the dialogue when you get back home. You can also use the event app on your smartphone to message other participants. Lastly, a few, few house rules. The forum general background paper on the, and the compilations of standards data and background reading are intended to assist and guide discussions and we would hope that you would find all find time to read them. 
they are available on the event app. this event is entirely web streamed and we do not allow private audio or video recording. if over the next two days you have the floor to ask a question or make a comment always use the microphone for web streaming and interpretation purposes and remember to state your name and organisation. i encourage you also to continue the discussion on social media using the twitter hashtag eu child forum. so let us now go to the first panel and i would like to invite commissioner jourov my commissioner from the dg justice and consumers i do not think she really requires a real introduction we know her as a champion of children's rights in the commission. please. Honourable members of the European Parliament, Madam Goraza Bildt, Madam Kinichi, Professor Novak, Madam Santos Pais, distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 11th European Forum on the Rights of the Child. And welcome back to those of you who were here last year. Who were here last year? quite a number. Let us continue our work because working in the field of rights of the child I have always two feelings. We will never be able to do enough. And the second is we need to come from words to actions. So I think that together after hearing that impressive list of the institutions you come from and, and the states you are coming from, uh, I think that all together we can bring the necessary change to make the conditions for, for the children better. And I also would like to welcome the young people, young speakers coming to give their testimonies, probably painful reality check which is so needed for all of us to understand the depth of the problem. So welcome Mr. Horvat, welcome Mr. Reza Hassanpour, welcome Mr. Raimond. Where is Mr. Horvat, by the way? He is outside. He is, outside. He is, in, is he nervous? I wanted to encourage him. So I want to encourage all of you to come and, and speak and to share with us your experience. Ladies and gentlemen, one year on, I am glad to recall that we adopted a communication on the protection of children in migration and we have since then taken all the necessary steps to set up a European network on guardianship for unaccompanied children. Guardians really do help to safeguard a child's rights. Follow up to the communication, we will uh, discuss this with the Member States experts on the 1st December. And I will take it back again to the meeting with the Ministers of Justice, because this is the topic we have to feed again and again, so that not to forget what is our duty. The guiding principle for this forum is that all children have the fundamental right to liberty. Deprivation of liberty may only be used as a measure of last resort. An ethic of care should guide all interactions with children. Ahead of this forum, I visited an Austrian juvenile detention facility and saw at first hand how important it is for children to feel that they are cared for and treated with full respect. We chose the topic of children deprived of liberty and alternatives to detention this year also to support the UN Global Study, which Professor Novak is leading. One of the primary aims of the UN study is to assess the scope of the phenomenon. So, let us look at some of the data we already do have now. For children suspected or accused of crime, we know that for the 18 member states, 
for which data were available in 2010 two percent of all children above the minimum age of criminal responsibility have had contact with the police. in the eu in general about one million children are facing criminal justice each year. some countries such as france and i discussed this with the french minister of justice a few weeks ago and also with the french prosecutors so in France, they are faced with difficult situations where children from other EU countries are involved in organised petty theft and are real victims of trafficking criminal organisations. This phenomenon happened a few years ago already and is not diminishing, unfortunately. When a network is dismantled and children are arrested, and most of the time follow restorative justice schemes, then they are often taken back by these networks and being sent to another country to continue the same traffic. This situation happened in several cases between France and Spain. Pre-charge police custody for children can last between 6 and 72 hours, and this period of time may be extended. Once a child is charged with a crime, limits on pre-trial detention duration vary greatly among member states. From the patchy data available, we know that for 2010, the ratio of community services and probation orders compared to custodial sentences was 10 to 1. Between 2008 and 15. We also observed a welcome trend to reduce the number of children in prison in the countries represented in this room today, but, as I said at the beginning, much more needs to be done. As regards children in migration, according to the latest statistics provided by the European Agency for Fundamental Rights in 2017, children were detained for up to 241 days. Remember that children in migration have committed no crime and also that the child's perception of time is so different to adults. A car journey really is longer for a child than for an adult. Growing up in an institution can also be a form of deprivation of liberty. An estimated 8 million children live in institutions worldwide. In Europe, the situation of children in institutions remains quite unclear. National authorities are not always able to identify how many institutions operate on their territory, registered or unregistered, let alone say how many children live in them. Both UN conventions on the right of the child and on the rights of persons with disabilities set a framework for children's rights. More action is needed in this regard. The 2013 recommendation on investing in children is still relevant to alternative care systems and poverty and discrimination. And the European pillar of social rights underlines the child's right to protection from poverty. I'll finish with one more figure. We know that up to one million children in Europe have a parent in prison. I hope these data gaps will convince you, if you still need it convincing, of the acute need for the UN Global Study. No longer should we hear no data, no problem. Let me pose a while with the EU actions in this field. This forum will be a first step towards implementing the Directive on Safeguards for Children who are suspects or accused in criminal proceedings. The law must be transposed by June 2019 and we will keep close steps on its implementation. Three articles in particular address deprivation of liberty of children. 
article ten underlines the procedural safeguards and mechanisms that must be in place to ensure the limitation of deprivation of liberty. article eleven stresses the need to use alternative measures to detention and article twelve foresees specific treatment of children deprived of liberty notably their separation from adults unless it is considered to be in the child's best interest not to do so. In addition, implementation of the right to an individual assessment and the right to a medical examination in the directive should ensure a holistic assessment of the child. In terms of financial support from the side of the European Union in 2018, we will once again make capacity building funding available for preparations for leaving care. The EU structural funds have played a major role in transfer from institutional to community and family-based care. Substantial resources have been earmarked for this in 2014 to 12 to 20 programming and you will hear more on that tomorrow. However, that transfer needs to continue at a faster pace in line with the quality standards set in the United Nations guidelines for the alternative care of children. In the past six years, we have spent at least 7 million euro on capacity building for child-friendly justice. In, 2011, uh, uh, in 2018, we will bring together these projects to consolidate the results and tools set up by these projects. This should help Member States implement the Directive on Procedural Safeguards for Children who are suspects or accused in criminal proceedings, which was adopted last year and can also be used to define future funding priorities. For 2018, we have also set aside 50,000 euro for research or on alternatives to detention to support the UN Global Study. We will work with all of you to prioritize alternatives to migration-related detention, especially in the light of the General Comment No. 23 of the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child and its standards on the child's right to liberty in the context of migration. Finally, as regards children of parents in prison, there are more and more examples of child rights compliant good practices that could easily be used more widely. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to invite you over the days to come and over today meetings to think in concrete terms about our common work and the goals, not only in abstract numbers. Let's think and speak about uh, and have the answers for the questions like what does it mean to be alone? What does it mean to lack support? What does it mean to feel like you have no future? Because these are the questions which the children ask themselves. I heard so many very sad stories from migrant children which made me to try to imagine how they feel here. Being in, on a strange place alone and they really asked us to give the answer on the question, who am I? The basic identity question, who am I? And what will be my future? What will be my perspective here? Who are the people to come and help me? These are the questions we have been able to ask as well and help them. So, I will stop here. Uh, I think that now it's high time that the young people will take the floor in a little while to share with us their experience of deprivation of liberty when they were children. Before I do it, I would like to tell you what my expectations are from this uh, 
forum and what should be the outcomes uh, from our discussions. First, greater awareness of the child's fundamental right to liberty. Second, support for the UN Global Study. Third, exchange of good practice across all settings. Fourth, clear prioritization of alternatives to detention, including through the use of EU and national funds. Drawing on the site event discussions, more focus on drivers for deprivation of liberty and last but not least, expert preparation for on time June 2019 transposition deadline for the directive I spoke about, the directive on procedural safeguards for children. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, I wish you fruitful discussion and look forward to working with you on follow-up to this forum. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Setting the scene and also putting the requests to us what we should be doing during this um, conference. Our next speaker is Member of the European Parliament, Anna Maria Corazza Bildt, who is active in many, many fields, also in human rights, and a co chair of the Child, of, uh, Child Rights Intergroup in the European Parliament. And we know her as a very forceful proponent of children's rights. Please. Thank you very much, and I hope, uh, Commissioner Jourova, you included me in the young people that we're going to speak. <laughs> well, great to be here uh, again to, uh, in this tradition to gather hearts and minds uh, among uh, the EU institutions, member states, the civil society to really put at the center of the policy agenda in Europe the best interest of the child. And as you so well said, Commissioner Jourova, to go from words to action. I would like to really thank for the sorry, a lot of things on the feet here. Yes. Thank for the tremendous work that you are doing, Commissioner. We enjoy very much in the intergroup of children's rights in the European Parliament, both my dear colleague Katarina Kinnici and I and my other colleagues, uh, the constant cooperation that we have with you, with Margarita Twitter, with Digi Justice and all the other key players in the Commission uh, devoted to the rights of the children and of course the civil society. Uh, some of my colleagues have been working. Hi, I see many of you here. Uh, I have been attending yesterday the panels you were part of and thank you for your important contributions. I promise we will take them to our heart and to our work in the European Parliament. For the first, no child is born criminal and no child is born terrorist. I hope we can all agree on that. But children become criminals and they can be recruited from terrorists while in detention. And in fact, detention is a sort of failure of society to take care of children. Therefore, prevention is so crucial. And for me, it's very much about family. It's very much about school. And of course, it is a national competence. Detention, prison are a national competence, but we have a common responsibility to get it right because it truly affects the entire life of a minor. We have a responsibility to get it right together with value-based policies. If anything has to be value-based, it's policies that have to do with children and detention. Value-based policy, key principle, EU legislation, and our constant monitoring in the European Parliament on the ways that member states implement the legislation and exchange of good practices. Because some of these dilemmas between detention and non-detention of which kind of custody really require to, to get the best practices about Europe and in the world together and uh, with the great help of the civil society. So uh, I will concentrate on the issue of detention uh, of migrants, because my dear colleague Katerina, who has enormous law, knowledge on criminal law, who is also in charge of the directive under the European Parliament on the procedure, is going to concentrate more on the issue of children in conflict of the law, criminal proceeding, and um, children in institution, children of parents in prison. You mentioned them all, Commissioner. I'm going to focus on what is really the core of our responsibility as co-legislator, which is children in migration. 
the intergroup has done a lot of work with many of you it is at the heart of our it is at the heart of our priorities and concerns. We are voicing the concerns, we are raising awareness about the vulnerability, the suffering and the distress of children in the move. And you know the numbers. The key principle that is driving our work is that a child is a child, regardless of its migrant status, and should be treated as a child first, with no discrimination with European children citizens. And you should never be detained because of your migrant status. Detention as migrant yet is happening in Europe right now. It is a violation of children's rights. And there is ample evidence and expertise that it is harmful and traumatic for children. It can have profound negative impact on the children's health, physical and mental health, psychological development, while damaging life Time with damaging lifetime consequences on the social skill, self-esteem and family ties. And you know that detained children are at risk of suffering all of depression. There are a number of cases of self-harm, not to talk about suicide. And I would like to say from all my many travels in refugee camps, uh, reception centers, detention centers across Europe, in other countries that behind every story of child there is really a heartbreaking story. We are talking about children that went through the desert, went through the Mediterranean, spent months and months before, before coming to Europe, kids, many of them kids, and you know what a dangerous travel and life and experience they had before coming and reaching the shores of Europe. Many of these kids have witnessed horrors that no adult has witnessed in Europe, not to talk about their peers when they meet at school together, hopefully, in Europe. I want to make an example, not to single out one member state, but because I had, it's an experience that has impressed me a lot in Moria, in Greece, in Lesbos Island, which is one of the big refugee camps. Many of you know it. It's been a big story all over Europe. I think it was 2016. Uh, where children were detained, unaccompanied minors were detained in Moria in very small uh, space. There were violence, there was trouble. And I have to say that in Greece, they have an extremely good system for unaccompanied minors. But it's on the continent, not in the islands. And there's lack of space. We visited also places in, outside of Athens where actually they had like 20 children, 25 children, they were extremely well taken care of with support of the European Union. So it's very much a lack of capacity than political will. But it's also that no European institution can deal with unaccompanied minors in Greece because of the Greek law, despite the amazing deployment of resources that we have there. So that was just one example that broke my heart, but there are many others. And the issue is that these children for them, when they come to Europe after all this suffering, Europe is a safe heaven. For them, Europe is freedom. And then they face detention. In many members, states, they still face detention. So what kind of message are we giving to them? And why this is important? It's important from the human point of view. But it's also important because, let's be clear, there is an entire generation of kids that is growing up hating Europe. Is that what we want? So detention centers are indeed also fertile ground for radicalization and recruitment. We know that prisons are a fertile ground for radicalization and recruitment, and also of sexual abuse and exploitation. I am the rapporteur for the implementation report on a directive that we adopted last month, 2011, on sexual abuse, exploitation, child pornography, and pedophilia. And we are actually... Uh, we are actually adopting it next week in committee uh, in, uh, in Libe. And I have added to the crimes committed against children also the issue, specific issue related to children in migration and children on the move, that we really need to step up cooperation, judicial cooperation, police cooperation, uh, combating traffic, combating smugglers, because um, the, we know that the amount of exploitation, sexual exploitation of children especially girls, is really, unfortunately, increasing very much. And these are school-aged children. Uh, we know that only one year lost 
when you are this age at school, it's really affecting you for life. They should be at school learning. So now let me tell you quickly what we have done in all the revision of the asylum package uh, to step up the rights of migrant children. And I have to say that I'm very proud that with the intergroup of children's rights, because of our cross-culture, but especially cross-political group nature, we have succeeded to adopt every single amendment. In, the, in, the, in Dublin 4, that we have actually adopt, just adopted, in the Director of Reception, in the Regulation on Procedures, and in the Regulation of Qualification. And last Monday, with my dear colleague Nathalie Grisbeck, we adopted, she was leading us, hi Nathalie, uh, the resolution on unaccompanied minors. We put very clearly a ban on detention on the grounds of migration. But it still was in EU law. It was in EU as a last resort and uh, exception measure. This mandate, EU law, has a ban on detention of children. In the European Parliament position, and here is my message. Trialogues are on the way. So I truly call on member states present here, or also those that are not present here, to stick to the position of banning detention of children on the move in Europe on migration grounds. There should be no discrimination with other minors in the way they are they are treated. And of course, we are calling to look for alternative non-custodial ways of dealing with children that commit crime. Society has also to protect itself from children who commit crime, but in a way that is future-oriented and not only and not punishing. Take away the only. So while revising the common asylum package, we have uh, we have included many of these examples on uh, non-custodial community-based placements, uh, foster family placement of unaccompanied children. Uh, Member states have different arrangements, and, and I don't enter into that because you have much more knowledge than I have, but alternatives to detention, and never detention with adults. So what we have uh, achieved now in the amendments that we have co-signed in the intergroup is also that uh, the issue of prevention, focusing on issues that help prevention, because prevention is crucial. You cannot deal only with detention when it's too late. And we have included that within five days, a guardian should be appointed. A guardian should be trained. The criminal records should be assessed, including, of course, if there are uh, crimes of sexual abuse, but also drug traffickings. And um, the second thing is direct access to school for, ch for migrant children. And the third is direct access, of course, to uh, health care. So let me talk a little about prevention, because this is really cool. When I have met many of these children in, in centers, and so what, why do they flee? Because I think it's important to recognize that members have true dilemmas. It's in a way too easy to say ban detention. They are really, they are really uh, big challenges in what to do with children that go missing, with children that flee, uh, the um, reception centers, and it's uh, very much about trust. So children flee because they don't trust law enforcement authorities. They're afraid that law enforcement authorities would detain them or return them forcefully because of the uncertainty on their future, because of too long proceeding of asylum and bad living condition. And of course, in detention, there is also a lot of fear uh, among children, and fear is a big push factor to leave. And then there is all the contacts they have with the smugglers and with the traffickers that tell them, you will reach your parents much faster if you ring that number than if you stay in the center. And they sort of build up this trust against the police. So prevention is very much about building trust. And here I think the civil society has a key role. Often when we talk to the police, they really recognize that the civil society can build trust with these kids much better than someone in uniform can. And thank you for everything you are doing here. And I would like to add the great role that Missing Children Europe is having on the huge, I would just mention this, on the huge alarm that we were the first one in the group responding a couple of years ago where Interpol uh, 
talked about this figure saying that 10,000 were just a very, very understated figure on how many children go missed in Europe. And of course, Europe should mean safety for children. We, we can all agree on that. So, horizontally, we have included all this provision to protect children in migration from detention and to find additional other kind of cares. And in Dublin now, in Dublin 4, we have included the issue that any transfer of children has to be based on the assessment of the best interests of the children, according, you will remember, to the ruling of the European Court that had banned this uh, going back and forth of children. When I met the children, one of the things they say, you wouldn't believe it, it's the uncertainty of their future, is not knowing why they are detained in Europe when they go back and forth, is, is not having a clue of what's going on that is one of the big source of stress and distress. So we have included, and our amendments were voted in, that child should met by someone not in uniform, in a child-friendly language, in a language they understand, and has the obligation for the member states to inform them of their status. This is a very important issue that we want uh, member states to, to implement. So to conclude, Many other issues that uh, I, I will now summarize. No double standards between European citizens and migrant citizens. Uh, fingerprinting. Please, fingerprinting is to protect children and to get them into the protection of children is not against children. It's a very important principle. So we have decreased the age from 14 to 6 in order to protect children because otherwise we cannot identify them when they start disappearing in Europe. Age assessment, you mentioned it. It's really important to do it in a way that respects that, that children are right holders and their physical and mental integrity. But it's important because otherwise you have children. I met some children even in Sweden. They didn't go to school because they didn't know if they were 19 or 17. And then you lose one year even in the country that had the absolute highest standards of, of the best interest of the child. So it is important to do it. It's better to do age assessment, then leave children out of school or out of health system because they cannot get the card. So, in conclusion, well, I have to say that member states have to fully uphold with the New York Declaration of Refugees and Migrants, including the resolution adopted by the General Assembly last year uh, in, um, uh, in the General Assembly in New York, signed by all EU member states in which they commit themselves to end child migration detention. And of course, I also call like the Commission on all member states to fully use the EU communication on protection of children in migration and to implement all the recommendations. And this, uh, this EC communication on protecting children on migration asks the member states to do everything possible to ensure that a viable range of alternatives to administrative detention of children is available and accessible. And as usual, I will conclude with a call of action for the member states. You are the ones responsible for executing European law. And we will, believe me, follow up. But uh, I would like to say in, uh, in conclusion that we really need to work together also to, to create a culture of non-tolerance of detention, of respect of children. It's not enough with the laws. We need to change the rhetoric. We need to include in the way we implement this legislation that children should be respected because they are right holders. And that's a long-term process that we really need to do together. And then striking a right balance between protecting society from crimes. I don't buy this do-good rhetoric. Children are only good and nice. It's not true. There are children, unfortunately younger and younger, that commit terrible crimes. So we have to protect society. We have to do prevention, of course. And we have to have a system of protective society that is not repressive, but it's investing in the future, recuperating children, recovering them, preparing them to, so that the restriction of freedom will lead to better enjoying freedom for the rest of their life. And then I would like to finish by saying that we invite you as Intergroup of China Rice on behalf of the European Parliament on Monday 20th of November, 1630, to celebrate together the International Day of Children. It's the first time we do it together with UNICEF, Your Child, many, many other organizations. 
all the organizations, the NGOs that support the Intergroup on Children's Rights. So you are most welcome 20 of November. Thank you for today. Thank you very much for explaining the reality and the consequences of detention both for the children and for the society and also highlighting the importance of prevention and trust and also the, the role of a civil society. Uh, now I would like to give the word to um, a member of uh, European Parliament, Katarina Kinici, who as mentioned um, has a deep knowledge in, in legal issues and especially has worked for the Italian Pro Public Prosecutor's Office and Italian Ministries and with juvenile justice. So I think we will get a very expert view on the matter. Thank you. Grazie, buonasera, buonasera a tutti e grazie alla Commissione e in particolare alla Commissaria Jourova per l'invito. Eh, io parlo in italiano, chiedo <ride> che Venia parlo in italiano. Volevo appunto ringraziare tutti intanto per, e la Commissione in particolare per l'invito ad essere presente a questo undicesimo forum sui diritti dei minori. Come è stato detto nella presentazione della... Ecco, il tema dei diritti dei minori è un tema che per me è diventato una scelta di vita. Ho lavorato tanto nel settore della giustizia minorile e qui ci sono le altre. Ecco, quindi eh, diciamo, chi conosce già questo impegno sono stata poi a capo del Dipartimento per la giustizia minorile e adesso nel Parlamento europeo sto lavorando anche su questo tema. E devo ringraziare davvero, ed è un ringraziamento sentito, non è solo formale o di maniera, la Commissaria Jourova che su questo tema è davvero impegnata e che ha sostenuto molto l'attività dell'intergruppo eh, che con la collega Corazza Bilt, che ringrazio a sua volta, stia mi fai capricci? Eh, però non ci arrendiamo, non ci arrendiamo mai. Dicevo l'intergruppo ha avuto forse il merito eh, di eh, stimolare, di spingere proprio l'attività delle istituzioni europee proprio sul tema della tutela. Un altro, uh, un altro merito che è quello di aver messo in contatto o comunque di aver facilitato il contatto fra le istituzioni europee, i vari Paesi e le organizzazioni che lavorano su questi temi, che sono un contributo prezioso quando si parla di tutela dei diritti, che danno un contributo ancora più prezioso quando si parla di tutela dei diritti dei bambini, che sono sempre i soggetti più fragili in tutte le situazioni. La la collega Corazza Bilt ha illustrato il tema dei minori migranti, lo ha fatto splendidamente, facendo emergere quanto sia drammatico per un bambino la condizione di migrante e quanto ancora più drammatico sia quella di detenuto minore privato comunque della libertà. Però ecco il tema che io affronterò è invece quello più generale, già magnificamente introdotto dalla Commissaria Jourova, dei minori in conflitto con la legge, dei minori in conflitto con le istituzioni. E, eh, è un tema che eh, tocca ovviamente tutti i Paesi, è vero, c'è stata una diminuzione, lo ha detto la Commissaria, del numero dei minori detenuti in ambito europeo, ma comunque rimane sempre un numero elevato quello dei minori detenuti. Anche per una considerazione, perché non soltanto si tratta di minori che vengono privati della libertà, ma perché purtroppo questa privazione della libertà non sempre rispetta quel principio del superiore interesse del minore e quel principio del, eh, diciamo, eh, posto dalle mh, diverse carte internazionali che in ogni caso, in qualunque tipo di situazione, le istituzioni devono sempre assicurare al bambino protezione e cure necessarie al suo benessere. Perché se è vero che la detenzione è, deve essere vissuta come una ultima razio, come la eh, diciamo, possibilità ultima rispetto ad altre misure alternative nel caso in cui il minore sia entrato in conflitto con la legge e abbia commesso dei reati, 
Sappiamo che non è purtroppo sempre così, sappiamo che le condizioni di detenzione non sono sempre condizioni adeguate, per esempio non in tutti i Paesi gli istituti per i minori sono separati da quelli degli adulti. Sappiamo che non in tutti i Paesi i bambini detenuti hanno quel supporto, che deve essere un supporto globale e integrato di diverso tipo di intervento, quindi l'istruzione, quindi le cure per la salute, quindi dei percorsi formativi, il sostegno, spesso il sostegno psicologico. Ci sono degli studi che certamente molti di voi conosceranno, che ci dicono che il tasso di incidenza nei minori detenuti di malattie o comunque di problematiche psichiche è un tasso molto, ma molto più elevato rispetto a quello dei ragazzi che non sono in condizioni di detenzione e spesso è proprio quella la causa del reato e allora ecco che bisogna intervenire in, in questo senso e noi come, come Parlamento europeo con ripeto il sostegno della Commissario Jourova abbiamo lavorato alla direttiva sulle salvaguardie dei minori imputati e indagati nel processo penale affrontando il tema a 360 gradi e stabilendo delle eh, garanzie e non solo per la fase del processo, ma anche per la fase della detenzione. E così, per esempio, fra queste garanzie abbiamo inserito innanzitutto il diritto all'informazione del minore, il diritto per il minore a partecipare al processo, a, a far sentire la sua voce, che è fondamentale, il diritto all'assistenza di un difensore, e lo abbiamo configurato come diritto irrinunciabile e come diritto che diciamo, scatta dal momento in cui il minore sa di essere indagato e che accompagnerà il minore per tutto il procedimento fino all'esecuzione della pena perché quella non è solo una difesa tecnica, l'assistenza del difensore, ma è una difesa e un'assistenza necessaria per attivare tutte le garanzie previste nel procedimento. E fra queste voglio citare, per andare un po' velocemente, perché il dibattito sicuramente di oggi e il panel è molto molto intenso e sicuramente molto significativo, quindi perdonatemi se vado un po' velocemente e forse un po' superficialmente, però quello che dicevo è che un altro aspetto fondamentale è il diritto del minore alla valutazione individuale. Perché? Perché ogni minore è una persona. Ogni bambino è una persona che ha una sua storia, che ha un suo vissuto, anche se piccolo, ha una sua storia, ha un suo vissuto, ha delle motivazioni che lo hanno portato a commettere il reato. E allora per ogni minore bisogna esaminare qual è la sua storia, qual è il suo vissuto, quali sono i suoi bisogni, quali sono le sue esigenze per far sì che il processo prima e poi la sanzione possa dare una risposta adeguata a quelle esigenze. Una risposta che non è e che non deve essere punitiva, ma deve essere una risposta di sostegno, di accompagnamento verso un percorso di recupero del minore. Allora per questo è necessario che ogni minore sia singolarmente valutato. E questo richiede naturalmente, e ripeto, non sempre questo si trova, ma noi questo abbiamo inserito anche nella direttiva, non solo la detenzione come extrema razio, non solo la detenzione separata, non solo la specializzazione delle, eh, diciamo, delle corti e poi anche delle forze di polizia, ma anche appunto una, eh, come dire, un indirizzo verso un'adozione privilegiata di misure alternative alla detenzione adeguate ai bisogni di quel particolare minore. Cioè bisogna personalizzare il processo, ma personalizzare poi anche la sanzione che a quel processo consegue. E' in questo senso che bisogna lavorare. La direttiva io credo dia delle indicazioni valide, delle indicazioni precise e mi auguro che entri in vigore nei tempi stabiliti in tutti i Paesi europei per uniformare i sistemi, ma soprattutto per far sì che il, il momento del conflitto fra il minore e le istituzioni, fra il minore e le leggi, diventi un momento, un'occasione, io dico, di educazione per quel minore, costruita su quel minore. Anche perché, e questo l'abbiamo visto, se la detenzione viene riempita di contenuti, di contenuti educativi, viene riempita di opportunità, di occasioni per il minore, si abbassa il tasso di recidiva. Cioè diminuisce la possibilità che il minore torni a commettere reati. Ma questo diminuisce ancora di più se si fa ricorso alle misure alternative rispetto alla detenzione. Vado velocemente a cito soltanto due esperienze. Eh, 
perché credo che sia necessario quando si parla di questi temi anche quello scambio di esperienze perché ciascun Paese può portare il proprio contributo a costruire un sistema a misura di bambino. Nel mio Paese, in Italia, gli istituti penali per i minorenni sono tutti istituti di eccellenza, ma ce n'è uno in particolare a Nisida, vicino Napoli, un posto tra l'altro splendido, dove i ragazzi vengono offerte tutte quelle opportunità di recupero che vengono offerte in tutte le carceri, con un valore aggiunto in più. Cioè ogni attività formativa, educativa, formativa, di sostegno, di recupero che viene offerta al minore, ha in sé la trasmissione attraverso l'attività educativa e formativa del senso e del valore delle regole per la convivenza civile, partendo dal rispetto, il rispetto per la persona. I ragazzi imparano innanzitutto ad avere rispetto per sé, a tenere pulite, a tenere ordinate le proprie cose nella propria stanza, a rispettare i compagni, le cose dei compagni, ad impegnarsi per dare ciascuno il proprio piccolo contributo affinché quella collettività che è all'interno del carcere sia una collettività che si muova secondo delle regole, regole importanti. E in effetti il tasso di recidiva dei ragazzi che escono dal carcere di Nisida è molto molto basso. Come basso il tasso di recidiva delle misure alternative, alle quali purtroppo ahimè forse tutti i Paesi, anche l'Italia, ancora facciamo poco ricorso. Fra questi una, la misura che in Italia è stata più sperimentata è quella della messa alla prova, cioè si sospende il processo, il ragazzo fa un percorso rieducativo all'esito del quale, se è positivo, si pronuncia addirittura l'estinzione del reato. È come se quel reato il ragazzo non l'avesse mai commesso, non rimarrà nulla sul suo certificato penale. Bene, si è si è constatato che nel caso di esito positivo della prova il, 50, il, ta, il tasso di recidiva si abbatte del 51%. E anche quando la prova dà esito negativo c'è comunque un abbattimento del tasso di recidiva del 36%. Beh, credo che già questi numeri ci dicano come debbano essere privilegiate le misure alternative alla detenzione. Io so di non avere molto tempo e quindi, ripeto, cercherò di, essere, di stringere ancora, ancora di più, anche per una ragione che dirò alla fine. E, eh, su questo, ecco, sul tema delle misure alternative, dicevo, c'è ancora davvero molto, molto da fare. Però anche qui voglio citare l'esperienza dell'Italia, non perché noi lavoriamo, credo bene, non perché siamo in assoluto i più bravi, ma perché l'esperienza che conosco è perché certamente ci sono altri Paesi che hanno esperienze similari ed è giusto che ci sia questo scambio. E sicuramente da contesti come questi questo scambio di informazioni sicuramente viene veicolato. Dicevo, il, nostro, il Dipartimento che io ho diretto, il Dipartimento per la Giustizia Minorile, oggi si chiama Dipartimento per la Giustizia di Minorile di Comunità, perché si è arricchito dell'esecuzione esterna anche per gli adulti. Ma questo nome, Giustizia Minorile di Comunità, è anche simbolico del senso che per aiutare i ragazzi che hanno vissuto un'esperienza penale a reinserirsi stabilmente nella collettività, nella società, occorre il contributo della comunità. Infatti, noi abbiamo fatto esperi alcune esperienze, alcuni progetti, tra l'altro finanziati anche dal, dalle istituzioni europee, per esempio di formazione lavoro dei ragazzi detenuti all'interno delle strutture fatti con il contributo delle imprese del territorio che hanno fatto questi corsi di formazione all'interno e poi hanno assunto questi ragazzi. Creare, io dico, un ponte fra il carcere e la collettività è fondamentale ed è fondamentale perché questi ragazzi vengano poi riaccolti senza prevenzioni, senza discriminazioni. Tutta la collettività deve lavorare in questo senso. Quindi bisogna spingere, e io credo che le istituzioni europee questo ruolo ce l'abbiano, per far cambiare anche la cultura, per togliere ogni tipo di discriminazione, per togliere ogni tipo di prevenzione, per far capire che tutta la collettività deve collaborare affinché un ragazzo che ha sbagliato, superato quell'errore, possa tornare a pieno titolo nella collettività. E in questa direzione noi stiamo lavorando, faccio un altro piccolo esempio, aprire le carceri alla collettività, far produrre della pasticceria e poi mettere un piccolo punto vendita all'interno del carcere al quale può accedere chiunque, ogni cittadino, 
È un'esperienza sicuramente positiva e importante. Quelle piccole manifestazioni teatrali, piccoli spettacoli aperti al cittadino che entra dentro il carcere, che quindi supera questa, questa difficoltà di rapportarsi col carcere, con chi è stato nel carcere, beh, anche questi sono momenti importanti, come è importante tutto il lavoro esterno che si può far fare ai ragazzi, anche ai ragazzi e ai ragazzi appunto detenuti. Però, e mi avvio davvero alla conclusione, Bisogna, come dicevo prima, spingere nella direzione di far comprendere a tutti i Paesi che la pena non deve essere, che la sanzione detentiva non deve essere è semplicemente espiare una pena per un reato commesso, ma deve essere un momento e un'occasione, e spesso è l'unica occasione per questi ragazzi, perché spesso vengono da contesti, da famiglie veramente in condizioni drammatiche. Allora deve essere l'occasione di rieducazione oppure, come dico io, spesso un'occasione di rieducazione, la prima forse occasione, la prima vera occasione di educazione. Bisogna preparare la collettività ad accoglierli. E bisogna, è vero, investire anche economicamente in questo, considerando che se noi recuperiamo questi ragazzi noi avremo un enorme risparmio per la nostra collettività in termini economici, perché non torneranno più in carcere, ma anche in termini di carattere più generale, in termini sociali, perché non commetteranno altri reati, non provocheranno altre sofferenze e altri danni. E allora è questa la direzione nella quale dobbiamo andare. Un ultimo cenno, perché mi sta particolarmente a cuore e poi concludo. Concluderò un po' a modo mio. <ride> un ultimo accenno, che è una cosa che mi sta molto a cuore e ringrazio ancora la Commissaria Jourova perché anche su questo ha notato grande sensibilità, i bambini figli di genitori detenuti. Noi in Italia abbiamo avuto un'esperienza di un protocollo con un'associazione proprio per dare sostegno e supporto per non interrompere la relazione fra il bambino e il genitore e per evitare quelle prevenzione e quelle discriminazioni nei confronti dei bambini figli di detenuti. Allora io eh, ecco, chiedo anche qui e lancio anche qui questa idea di un memorandum che a livello europeo possa regolare ecco, questo, questo tema del eh, sostegno ai bambini figli di genitori detenuti. Detto questo io voglio concludere, però voglio concludere lasciando la parola a loro, ai ragazzi dentro e ragazzi dentro le carceri e dentro il sistema penale. Non ho potuto portarli qui, ovviamente, però ho portato dei frammenti di un video che io credo sia molto bello e realizzato dal Dipartimento per la Giustizia Minorile. Sono dei frammenti, sono delle testimonianze, che però vi prego di ascoltare, perché ascoltandoli io credo ci renderemo conto tutti che abbiamo la responsabilità di farci carico del futuro di questi ragazzi. E il futuro è adesso. Io... Sono qua dentro da cinque anni, ho una pena commessiva di nove anni. Il mio reato non lo voglio dire perché non sono orgoglioso di quello che ho fatto. Ho fatto degli sbagli nella vita e purtroppo nella vita i sbagli si pagano. Il mio rapporto con gli altri ragazzi è cambiato molto rispetto al prima del reato perché prima non vedevo la malignità nelle persone. Ora invece, prima di attaccarmi a una persona, dargli fiducia, devo sapere chi è. Io sono entrato qui a 17 anni, adesso ne ho 20. Nella vita si può sbagliare, però l'importante è capire e sapere di poter rimediare. La vita è di me stesso, di me stesso. E già lo sai, già lo sai, fino a che non è finita, samurai, come unico padrone la mia vita. E eh sì, la vita è dura. O è vero, è piuma, non basta ciò che passa la fortuna. Questa esperienza qua anche che è un'esperienza brutta, possiamo dire che anche è un'esperienza positiva, perché ho capito tante cose, come l'importanza della scuola, e infatti quest'anno sto frequentando il quinto anno, mi vorrei diplomare. Nel Tribunale dei Minori abbiamo stabilito che venivo affidato ai servizi sociali. Mi sono trovato benissimo, mi sono trovato, ho trovato affetto, ho trovato persone sincere, ho trovato persone che mi aiutavano, se avevo dei problemi cercavano di capire i problemi che avevo, non cercavano diciamo, di criticarmi, buttarmi giù e né niente, anzi facevano di tutto per rialzarmi. Il mio futuro lo penso facendo una vita normale, 
smettendola di finire in carcere, sposandomi e avendo dei bambini. Vorrei fare la parrucchiera. Io vedo il mio futuro molto positivamente, perché anch'io ho la volontà di migliorarmi e di migliorare la gente che mi sta vicino, perché se non c'è gente capace accanto a te che ti aiuta e ti sopporta, non puoi andare da nessuna parte da solo. La libertà è tutto. La libertà è una parola rossa. Pian piano verrà per tutti. La libertà è tutto. Grazie. Thank you very much giving the overview um, of the legal instruments uh, providing the guarantees and the safeguards for children and where there's always the individual assessment in center and also um, giving us uh, good examples, best practices where the prisons can bridge or there can be a bridge between the prisons and the communities and the youngsters can really be brought back to the society. And thank you also for the, the video. Uh, now we will move to a maybe more academic view of uh, the, our issue. We have here an international human rights academic professor in various universities who has also worked widely for international organizations, the UN, Council of Europe and uh, EU, and who now is the independent expert leading the global study on children deprived of liberty. Manfred Nowak, please. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair, uh, Commissioner Jourova, Members of Parliament, ladies and gentlemen, friends. Um, I am very, very grateful uh, to you, Commissioner Margaret Tweed, uh, and your team for having dedicated this annual uh, EU uh, forum to the thematic of children deprived of liberty, and by that also very clearly supporting the global study on children deprived of liberty. Um, and I uh, have prepared a short uh, PowerPoint presentation. Um, I know that many of you are very well aware about the background, etc., so I will do it fairly, fairly quickly. Um, uh, as you know, um, there have been two earlier uh, global studies uh, by Grasa Magel uh, on children and armed conflict and uh, by Paolo Sergio Pinheiro on violence against children. Uh, and both have uh, really had an impact and also resulted in the appointment of special representatives of the Secretary General on those two topics. And I'm very happy that Marta Santos Pais is uh, with us today. Uh, she is uh, representing violence against uh, children. Um, and they were in 1996 and 2006 and 10 years later, almost 10 years later, the General Assembly then decided uh, in 2014 to request the Secretary General uh, to commission uh, an in-depth global study on children deprived of liberty, which is directly following up to the topic of violence against children. Um, in 2015, um, the Secretary General established uh, a high-level task force consisting of the major UN agencies. Uh, the task force is chaired by Marta Santos Pais. The second SISG is in there and also the Committee on the Rights of the Child. And I'm very happy that the current president, uh, chairwoman of the committee, Renate Winter, is also among us. Um, in the next year, there was, uh, on the basis of a proposal by the task force, um, a budget of 4.7 million U.S. dollars has been developed and uh, accepted by the Secretary General and uh, Jan Eliasson, that time Deputy SG, has uh, uh, made a, a fundraising appeal to all member states of the United Nations. Uh, and one month later, I have been appointed um, as the independent expert leading the global study, and that really means leading. It is a joint effort by many different actors, in particular UN agencies, 
non governmental organizations, the academic community, uh, and many others. Uh, and uh, last year, also, the GA said that I should actually um, already submit the final global study in September 2018 to the General Assembly. There is an advisory board, uh, high-level persons um, of, the, of academia and practice. Uh, uh, you see them here. Some of them are here, like uh, uh, Dainius Puras is here, the Special Rapporteur uh, on the right of uh, health. Um, also Benoit van Kaisblik uh, for DCI. Um, and um, so we have a steering board. Um, that's a task force, but we also have an advisory uh, board. And, of course, non-governmental organizations were very, very important uh, in the run-up, so in order to uh, really demand, together with the Committee on the Rights of the Child, that there should be such a global study, um, and um, they were very much in supporting from the very beginning, this global study. We have altogether 139 uh, NGOs involved, and you see here the most important ones who are the core group and the two core conveners, DCI and Human Rights Watch, which is also represented today here. Uh, as I said, the GA also said very clearly academia should be involved and uh, when we developed uh, a methodology we said uh, we should uh, really do research on the various areas of deprivation of liberty in close cooperation between UN agencies, NGOs and the academic community. Um, and since I am involved uh, both in the Boltzmann Institute of Human Rights in Vienna and in the European Interuniversity Center uh, for Human Rights and Democratization, uh, which is running a global campus of seven master programs in all regions of the world, uh, where we are more than 100 universities participating, I involved both of these organizations, but there might be many other academic institutions that will contribute to the global study. And we did already in, in, in involving academics and also students writing their PhD or master thesis on specific topics related to the global study. Now, so far, my activities were primarily uh, promotional uh, with international organizations, with uh, governments, uh, ambassadors, in creating awareness about the need and the importance of the global study. Um, but unfortunately, many of those activities were also fundraising activities because the General Assembly unfortunately has said that uh, these 4.7 million would have to be uh, contributed by voluntary contributions. Um, and uh, I will come back to that at a later point. Um, we had many uh, meetings with the NGO panels, uh, but we also did work on substance, and most importantly, we had an expert meeting which was uh, organized in, in Venice. We organized it there, where we finalized uh, a questionnaire that to be sent out to all governments, national human rights institutions, um, academia, uh, civil society. Um, so that is for a global study the most important tool so that we receive uh, responses because we want to know primarily how many children are currently deprived of liberty in the different types of institutions. Um, I also reported to the General Assembly in, in October this year, uh, providing them with some kind of interim report, but primarily with the dramatic financial situation that we are currently in. We had a, a, a regional consultation um, in Warsaw uh, by the OECE Human Dimension Seminar devoted to children deprived of liberty. Uh, and as I said, I see also this current uh, forum as a regional contribution uh, by the European Union uh, to this important topic. 
why do we need uh, a global study? I think uh, it was said already uh, by Commissioner Jourov at the beginning. The starting point is Article 37 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which is very, very clear, saying deprivation of liberty is only a measure of last resort and, if absolutely necessary, for the shortest possible period of time. So it means, in principle, children should not be deprived of liberty. You have to have very, very strong reason, be it in the criminal justice system or in other systems, that you might deprive children of liberty. You should always try to find alternative measures. Now, if you look at reality, and I know that very well from my time as UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, uh, but uh, from many of the, the evidence that we got in the side event yesterday and today, that in reality far too many children are detained in prisons, in pretrial detention facilities, in police lockups, uh, in all kinds of institutions, children's homes, orphanages, uh, special institutions for uh, children with disabilities, uh, drug uh, and alcohol using uh, children, refugee and migrant children, child soldiers, etc. Um, and, and that is the main reason, or one of the main reasons for the global study, in fact, there are no reliable statistical data. Uh, we always hear, again from UNICEF, uh, about one million children, but that's a very old data, and it's not really based on evidence. It's more an estimate. Uh, there are no reliable statistical data on the number of children deprived of liberty, uh, but also not on the reasons, uh, on alternative measures. Much has been achieved in relation to deinstitutionalization uh, in recent years in Central and Eastern Europe, for instance, in the Central, A uh, Central Asian republics, etc., but we still do not have those facts well documented. Um, and uh, childhood is the formative time in everyone's life, and putting children behind bars uh, is really leaving a very, very deep mark in, in their lives, but also in the life of uh, the society they are living in. Um, as I said, I, I was six years uh, Special Rapporteur on Torture. I visited uh, 18, on official fact-finding mission, 18 countries in all regions of the world. I uh, visited uh, hundreds of uh, places where Adults and children are deprived of liberty, interviewed thousands of persons. Uh, for me, it was always the most difficult if you find children as young as three years or six years or eight years that have been in many countries already convicted of some minor crime and simply put behind bars uh, as a punishment. But of course, uh, many of them were in institutions, uh, in migration detention. So you have here one African example, in, in sometimes in the most horrible conditions, put together with men in torture rooms like here. Uh, so one is Africa, the other one is Europe, uh, in a migration detention center, uh, where I found uh, conditions of detention which are as bad as in, in, in the worst countries in Africa or Asia. So what are the main objectives? Uh, first of all, as I said, um, to assess the magnitude we really want to know how many children are deprived of liberty. This aggregated, of course, by age. Are those small children? Are these uh, juveniles? Uh, also by gender, uh, to some extent, uh, whether they are citizens or non-citizens. Uh, but we also want to find out what are the reasons behind the root causes, the length of deprivation of liberty, etc. But it's not... Uh, naming and shaming exercise. It's not finger pointing. We want to ask states to provide us with best practices. What have you done in recent years? So we are asking also in the last 10 years, what changed and why could you reduce the number of children deprived of liberty? What were the alternative measures that you applied so that other states could also learn from the experiences that we will gather by, by this exercise. Very important is, and I am very grateful also to Margaret and others for today, that we heard 
testimonies of children, of persons who were deprived of liberty in their childhood, it is extremely important to give children a voice uh, in the global study. If we raise necessary funds, we will have special consultations by inviting children from all regions of the world to speak out, to tell us what they actually experience, what are the long-term consequences. To raise awareness, already, and we know that from the earlier global studies, the very fact of collecting those data, and many data are not yet available, raises awareness among government officials that deal with those statistics, among those who are responsible for uh, prisons or institutions, etc. So the, the joint collection of data by different UN agencies, by government officials and by civil society, by itself has an important awareness raising effect. And of course, on the basis of that, this data collection, then we have the evidence that we need in order to develop well-reasoned recommendations, drawing again upon the best practices what can be done, and we can show in country A or B, this has been done, and the effect was a reduction of 90%. And we have those ex examples already today, uh, to provide recommendations uh, to governments, but of course also to international organizations, what can be done in order to reduce as much as possible the situation of children deprived of liberty. So it's less about improving the conditions of detention, that's of course also important. But we are not so much saying as long as you improve the conditions, you can keep them in detention. No, you should apply the Convention on the Rights of the Child and that means you should only detain them as a measure of last resort. What are the six key focus areas that we are dealing with from left to right up? So of course children deprived of liberty within the administration of justice. And that depends, of course, very much also on the minimum age of criminal responsibility. In some countries, like here in Togo, uh, it's seven years old. So I found eight, nine-year-old children convicted of crimes behind bars for 24 hours a day. Uh, then, of course, children deprived of liberty on national security grounds, children deprived of liberty in institutions, for migration-related reasons, uh, in the context of armed conflict, child soldiers, and also children living in places of detention, primarily in prisons, uh, but also migration-related uh, detention, together with their parents. Uh, what are the different standards? There are huge differences up to which age you are allowed to, as, as a mother in particular, to take your kids with you in the prison. What are the interests of the child, what are the interests of the mothers, etc. The methodology uh, is both quantitative and qualitative research. Our most important sources of information are, of course, the responses to the questionnaire. We hope to send out the questionnaire by the end of the year uh, and uh, give states about half a year in order to collect the data so that by summer we hope already we have the first responses from governments. Then we would like to carry out regional and thematic consultations. There are many states that are actually interested and willing uh, to host uh, regional consultations such as Ethiopia, Uruguay and, and a variety of other states. Um, then, of course, statistical data uh, from various sources, statistical offices of the United Nations, uh, from Eurostat and, and, and many other statistical offices, national ones. Again, as I said before, the views and experience of children themselves are a very, very important source of information uh, for us and further information provided by states, intergovernmental and non-governmental organizations, and academic research, which can start as soon as we have the necessary funds to really kick off uh, the, the, the whole exercise. And that brings me to my last slide, um, and that is the financial situation and the way forward. Uh, as I said, uh, the, the fundraising appeal by Jan Eliasson was in September 2016, before I have actually been appointed. 
as an independent expert uh, and I have to tell you more than a year later we still are stuck with the financial contributions of only two small member states of the United Nations, Switzerland and Austria. And I am very grateful to both countries that they supported the global study from the very beginning. Uh, but this amounts to about 5% of the budget that we need, and with that we will certainly not be in a position to carry out the global study. Uh, so that's why uh, we started a, a kind of um, emergency fundraising campaign uh, during this summer, um, and I must say again, I'm extremely grateful, in particular the whole, the whole NGO panel, that they were very, very supportive, uh, but also the Boltzmann Institute and many others that contributed uh, to this fundraising campaign. We approached governments, but also the private corporate sector foundations, um, and I should say it's slowly getting better. But what we have said, by the end of this year, we need one million U.S. dollars. Otherwise, it will be very difficult to carry on. And we will have a task force meeting to, to decide about the future on 20th of November in, in Geneva. So that's why I'm also using this opportunity to really appeal, first of all, to the European Union, because this is an EU um, uh, forum here, um, to the European Union, who was also very much the driving force behind the GA resolution, and the European Union is also in the best position uh, to go forward with best practices uh, within the EU member states, uh, to really becoming the kind of pioneering of the pioneer of the global study uh, by also contributing uh, to the, the financial needs but of course the EU and its member states, other member states or other states, foundations and the corporate sector. But as I said, uh, I am convinced, I, I remain to be an optimist, it's not my first fundraising exercise. I didn't actually think when I was appointed that most of my time would be used for fundraising activities. I hope by the end of the year I, I, I can say we have reached this and we can really now dedicate our time uh, to um, to, 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 to starting really the substantive work, to send out the questionnaire and to do our research. So I think as a joint activity, I am confident. Uh, and again, what we heard yesterday, it showed us so strongly yesterday and this morning. Uh, all this evidence that we received showed us there is this need. I'm deeply convinced if we carry out the global study, it will have a major impact on the situation of children deprived of liberty. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for presenting us the importance of the study. Uh, I think evidence-based policy was mentioned earlier in the speeches and without real good data about the magnitude of the problem, we don't know how to do evidence-based policy. But we also heard about the amount of work that goes behind when doing such a study and the width of knowledge that is needed. Um, we were also reminded of the reality of money and I hope that you can go back to your member states and, and maybe um, tell something about this. Unfortunately, Commissioner Jourova had to leave but she told me that she will be watching the, the web stream so that she will also know what others have said here today. And then we'll move to our uh, next uh, speaker who is also from the global level, from the UN, has a long career in UNICEF, I think, at least for me, uh, uh, since childhood. Uh, UNICEF was one of the agencies best known of the UN agencies. And at the moment, she is now the special representative of the UN Secretary General on Violence Against Children. So please, Marta Santos Pais. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here today. 
and uh, I would like to start by again congratulating the European Union for placing this topic at the heart of the European Forum. I was privileged to be in the very first session and I have to say that the audience has certainly grown but when we talk about children deprived of liberty very often we don't have so many candidates and today we have strong committed people and no doubt this will make a difference for the global study and for the situation of children affected. Um, as Manfred Novak has mentioned, I am very pleased to be chairing the United Nations Task Force on Children Deprived of Liberty. And of course, as you will imagine, this is a priority for my mandate, but it is a priority for all the agencies and actors who within the United Nations family remain very committed to breaking the invisibility of this topic and to putting the rights of children affected by deprivation of liberty really at the heart of policy making and resource mobilization. The study will certainly benefit from it. Um, you, you will probably not be surprised if I say that deprivation of liberty is very closely connected with violence against children. And in fact, many of the children who find themselves deprived of liberty have simply run away from a very violent home. Some of them are trying to run away from countries that have been devastated, destroyed by war, instability, organized crime, violent gangs trying to find a safe place to survive and grow up somewhere else. Um, some others are simply young people who are um, taken by prostitution rings, traffic and cartels, drug cartels, and who end up being perceived not as victims, but as uh, in complicity with criminal activities. The list could go on, no doubt. Uh, national security grounds, violent conflicts, of course, you know them very well. But what is dramatic, and we have heard it already a number of times, be it in closed institutions, in psychiatric centers, in migration facilities, or in adult prisons, these children very often not only do not understand why they are deprived of liberty, but they have great difficulty in access any justice system who can evaluate why they are there, for how long they are there, what kind of institution they find themselves in, and challenging deprivation of liberty is for a child really a labyrinth. I'm a lawyer, as many of you in this room, we know how difficult it is for a child. It's of course an impossible discussion. Uh, what is very sad also is that when children are deprived of liberty, they suffer so many times situations of harassment, of sexual abuse, and acts of torture. And in fact, we know that legislation, in fact, legitimizes in many places around the world the use of violence as a form of discipline, of punishment, or of sentencing. I will give a few examples in, in a second. And so when I visit countries around the world and so many places of detention, I hear this question by young people over and over again. And what they say is, why are people looking at us as human beings without values and without a value for society? And when will we be looked at as children like anybody else? And sometimes it's hard to give an answer that is convincing for them. And no doubt the young participants who are here with us will tell us much better than I can report from my missions. We have heard many important objectives by the global study. And to me, perhaps the most important is really to prevent deprivation from happening in the first place. And as we heard, in so many places we can invest in alternatives to deprivation of liberty. But if you look at the legislation of so many countries, the fact is that the law does not establish them clearly and judges are not trained to go through the list before they use deprivation of liberty really as a measure of last resort. So it comes as the first option in the mind of people. And of course, as we heard, we need to change the culture in society. People don't like to talk about young people deprived of liberty for whatever reason. They don't like to look into the conditions of detention and they are not ready to lobby in favor of the safeguard of their rights. But I think this study, as Manfred Novak has stressed, can really bring great models of alternative ways of addressing this topic. And I just want to use an example from a very distant country, but of course the European Union has a great opportunity to mobilize support and to, and to assist countries all over the world. I want to tell you about Indonesia. We are, think, we are talking about a huge country with millions and millions of children. 
Well, a few years ago, we worked together with the government of Indonesia to try to reformulate the speci a specialised justice system for children to raise the minimum age of criminal responsibility and to invest in alternatives to deprivation of liberty. And the main measure that was promoted was restorative justice. As we heard a moment ago, the aim of the justice system should not be to punish, it should be to restore the harm that has been promoted rather than stigmatizing the child who is so often used by others to commit criminal activities. And the truth is that this was supported by a huge investment in the capacity of professionals of the whole justice system. And there is a huge change to note, just one example of course. Before the new law, every year there were at least 5,000 children deprived of liberty. Well, after the adoption of the law, the number has decreased by 30% and the diversion has been increasing from 7 to more than 50%. So change is within reach, it's a question of political will, it's a question of investment. So I'm hopeful, that, like Manfred Novak, we can make a change. But today I wanted to mention two issues that to us are particularly important when we look at the global study in the light of our own work. And the first is the situation of girls. I'm very pleased that in the video that we just watched uh, from Italy, there was also the voice of girls deprived of liberty. But you may know that in many, many, many countries, their number seems to be very small. In fact, we don't have the data, as we heard, but according to some studies, it is felt that girls deprived of liberty are between 5 and 10 percent of all young people deprived of liberty. And we may think, well, that's so small, why should we care? What is very dramatic is that when we look at the studies and data that are available, we see that while the deprivation of liberty of boys has been decreasing, the number of girls deprived of liberty is increasing, in fact. So that is already, of course, a red flag for us. But what is most dramatic is that the reasons why girls are deprived of liberty very often have nothing to do with the practice of a criminal offence. It's very often connected with sexual abuse and arrest. Why? Because in so many legislations around the world, we see the criminalization of immoral character to use the wording of the law, or perverse conduct. And a girl who is accused of having uh, sexual relations without being married may face, as you know, situations of flogging, uh, situations of stoning, situations of capital punishment, still in many countries around the world. And for a girl who is deprived of liberty, of course, the heavy of the sense of shame, of fear, of, uh, you know, social pressure is extremely high. And trying to tell a police officer or an authority about the trauma and the suffering these girls have gone through is very often a very difficult wall because people don't seem to be ready to listen and are very ready to dismiss or to just do nothing about it. In most countries, we don't have tailored non-custodial measures thinking about the situation and the needs of girls. We don't have community-based programs that are thought because of them. I, I'm not even thinking about the individual assessment of each one, which should be the rule, as we have heard. And if you think about the lack of vocational training, life skills, or the care for children who are born of young uh, women who are deprived of liberty, girls who are deprived of liberty, of course, very often there is nothing I have in my memory, dramatic situations of young girls that I have met in this regard. But in addition, because they are a small number, they are placed very far away from home, uh, very far away from any possibility of contact with friends and family, and they find themselves very often also placed with adult women, suffering harassment, at times um, abuse, very traumatic situations of abuse, and they suffer still very invasive body searches and harassment and torture by correctional staff. So it's a very painful and dramatic situation. And of course, it's not surprising that so many of these girls suffer high depression and end up so many times thinking about self-harm as a way out. That is too sad, of course. But there are also very positive situations, and I think the global study can tell us about how do we turn this reality around and how do we create a new sense of hope for girls, of course, as well as boys. 
The second area, and I will end with this, is something that we are very committed to be doing, and I'm, again, so happy that young people are with us here. We really believe that it's fundamental to listen to the views and experience of children and young people deprived of liberty or affected by situations of detention. And we are at the moment conducting a very interesting research uh, initiative with a number of countries in Latin America and civil society in Latin America and with the support also of our colleagues from UNICEF. And I would like to share with you some preliminary findings of our research of children, of parents who are deprived of liberty. And we have a few small brochures to give to you afterwards um, in, in the following sessions. But overall, what they are telling us is that staff in correction facilities are really not trained or prepared to look at us as children and to treat us with respect. And for those children who try to connect and uh, keep the bonding with their parents deprived of liberty, the sense of fear and insecurity is limitless. They may travel for very long hours, sometimes for some days, to get to the prison and try to stay with their parents, probably for a few minutes in very crowded facilities under the very heavy look of correctional officials and very stigmatizing appreciation of people around. For them, keeping that relationship is certainly almost impossible, and they go back with their broken heart and certainly very often not willing to go back again. Uh, these children are surrounded by ostracism and marginalization and a deep sense of hopelessness. And in fact, what, this is what they are telling. First of all, we feel rejected, avoided and feared by other children and other families who look at us as the bad example because we come from a bad family. And sometimes they say we feel as if we have done something wrong and we committed a crime rather than a member of the family. At school, of course, they are bullied very easily, uh, certainly by peers, but very often also by teachers who leave them at the end of the class. Um, they feel very ill-treated most of the time. And then they th you may think family life will help overcome all of this. Well, family life is miserable, you know. It's so difficult and painful. Because, in fact, there is only one. Sometimes there is none if it is a single parent. And when there is a single parent, the risk of placement in an institution is certainly very high. So children feel depressed, as anybody else in the family, but they also feel affected by the economic burden on the household. So they try to cover for that. They try to have a little job to bring additional revenue for the family, very often facing very dramatic situations in very dangerous places and facing additional harm and the risks of being uh, manipulated by crime organizations, for instance. All of this, the need to work, the lack of a routine nurturing family environment, the absence of social protection measures that can give them the support they need, and certainly also the, the lack of a well-tailored education system who is ready to open the arms for kids who have a particular need of assistance and protection are certainly not there. And this leads to dropout and absenteeism, of course. This leads to losing opportunities for gaining life skills. These children suffer dramatically. But what we have felt is very encouraging, especially for the younger until 10 years of age. They never lose hope. And they still look at the future with a sense of positive feeling. But if we miss investing in supporting them, that positive feeling may turn around in becoming something very, very different. So let me just share some four recommendations that they have shared with us very strongly. The first thing they tell us is that it's fundamental to create safe spaces where young people of who have parents deprived of liberty can talk about this situation with other members of the family, with other friends, but with their own parents, of course. And this is the only way that will help them overcome the traumatic silence that surrounds their lives. They prefer not to talk about it, of course, and they 
they find no one to talk to in the end. Secondly, they always stress the need to prevent and address measures of violence that may affect them or the family around, uh, throughout this process. And one of the things they say is that such uh, measures and police measures need dramatically to change. It should be absolutely forbidden that any police should be allowed to enter the house and beat the parents in any circumstance. And we think, how should this happen anyway? Thirdly, they of course call for better psychosocial and financial support for them and for their families, you know. But they want also these measures to be tailored to the different phases of the execution of a sentence or the separation from them, uh, their separation from their parents with a strong investment in education and life skills. And finally, of course, they reaffirmed this ambition of having a friendly and supportive environment to meet with their parents in prison. And they, of course, recall this heartless and very traumatic experience that I have mentioned a moment ago. But they say very simply, we need longer visits, better quality visits, and we simply want to be treated humanely and with respect for our dignity. And when we listen to this, we know we think about the fact that within a couple of days, we will celebrate 28 years of the adoption of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And that was the dream we, we all had 30 years ago, right, when we were behind this treaty. And for these kids, it's so distant, so illusory, so, you know, unattainable. But we can make a difference, and I'm sure you will help us make a difference. For us in the United Nations, we continue to stress that deprivation of liberty of children needs to be prevented because this is a human rights imperative, because it is a smart thing to do economically. We don't have the time to go into it now. But it's also now a very important investment for sustainable development. And I believe that children deprived of liberty can be the best indicator of how well we are implementing and moving towards the achievement of the sustainable development goals, which calls for leaving no child behind. I'm sure you will help us, and we have great hopes the European Union will continue to support us in this regard. Thank you again. Thank you for sharing with us your deep knowledge of the reality and also highlighting the, the difficult situation of girls deprived of liberty. But you also mentioned that change is possible and that there is hope. Um, I think quite a few speakers have mentioned that we need to listen to the children, we need to listen to, to young people. And I'd like to ask now David Raymond to give his personal um, testimony, then we will have coffee and there will be other testimonies after that. So please, David. <laughs> Hello, my name is David Raymond and I'm from Cork City in Ireland. The main reason that led to my imprisonment was addiction. For me, all of my offending was alcohol related. <clears throat> because I had a problem with using alcohol, I would get stopped by the guards <clears throat> for being drunk and disorderly. I came to the attention of the guardee at first when I was 16. I had a series of charges in relation to drunk and disorderly behaviour. The system was a joke in that my case would be heard in the court on Fridays but would keep getting adjourned as a result of my charges. From age 16 didn't come to conclusion until I was 17. I spent little time in the juvenile court in spite of being under 18 and it was when I turned 18 that I was convicted. My first sentence was for two months for being drunk and disorderly and I also received the fine. I served just one week of this in Cork Prison. My understanding my understanding was that I would be in prison for two months, but one of the guards after the court told me that the judge had done this to give me a fright, and I would be released after a week. <clears throat> I was incredibly scared about going into prison. I had just turned 18. In the part of the prison I was in, I was surprised that most of the people were okay. I think this is because they would be away from drugs and alcohol when they are in prison. There were other people in the prison that would be more difficult to be around. I was just getting a taste of how things would work in prison and then I was back out and I thought at this time I would never be back there again. When I was released from prison I still had charges waiting overall. These took a period of two years to be dealt with. I was still struggling with addiction also 
and an incident happened with fighting which should not have happened and then I was charged with assault and drunk and disorderly and got sentenced for five months of which I served seven weeks. This was a whole different ball game. I was sharing a cell with a man who was in prison for murdering his best friend. He was in his 40s, he is serving a life sentence. The man in general wasn't too bad and I felt like he was looking out for me because I was in prison. I was not targeted but I saw others targeted physically over small things over a toaster. One or two of the prison guards were alright, others would be verbally aggressive to you for small things like asking for a tea bag, shower gel or shampoo. You could be put down and downgraded for asking for simple things. I went into prison with a broken jaw. It had been reset. I was supposed to be given a soft diet. I wasn't and it would take me 30 to 45 minutes to eat my dinner as a result. What I found frightening was that there were people in for very petty crimes and others for serious crimes and they could be mixed in together. My cellmate should have been entitled to a cell of his own in a different wing. I think this was because of overcrowding. Visits for me were good to see my parents, but I could see how it would be more difficult if you had a partner or a girlfriend visiting, as physical contact was so limited. The adjournments were the main thing that I found really negative for two years. I didn't know where I was going or what was going to happen, and this made it very difficult to move on. Also, this led to charges building up from when I was 16, which I was not charged with until I was 18, and then sentenced just as I turned 18. The main positive thing that helped was the consistent support of my parents. They attended every court date and they missed a lot of work and lost out on income as a result. Being involved in probation was positive for me and they also funded and encouraged me to seek drug treatment, but this took a long time to happen. It didn't help also to have probation workers changed. You would start to build up a relationship with someone and then have to work with someone else. Also, my local youth club was helpful. The changes I would like to see for young people is more youth facilities, more time with workers and for youth workers not to change all the time. Also I think things should be processed much quickly, quicker in the juvenile system. It would be much better for young people if when they did something there was a consequence quickly for it. I would worry about young people struggling already with mental health and how being in the court system and how this goes on and on and would impact negatively on this. I also feel young people should have quicker access to drug counselling and treatment. I would also like to thank every person individually for listening here today. I would also like to thank Don of the Cork Life Centre for providing me with an opportunity like this so not only my story but the struggle of many other juveniles can be heard. Thanks. Thank you very much. I don't think there is anything to add to that. So, uh, but I think we have all earned a coffee. So it's a 15 minutes break, if I understood correctly. So please be back here, uh, well, uh, quarter two. Thank you. Yeah.
Okay, everybody, if you'd like to take your seats, we're going to start. And I need a, an annoying noise. Okay, please take your seats. Uh, there are lots of people. Okay. Big clap. Thank you. Yes, good job. <laughs> that was a very authoritative clap from uh, Simon Mordew, Deputy Director General from DG Migration Home Affairs. Thank you, Simon. Welcome back, everybody to this second high-level plenary session on EU and international commitments on children deprived of liberty. We are running very, very late. That's the first message. Um, the interpreters have to stop at half past six. That's one constraint. Simon Mordew has to leave at half past six. So um, I will simply introduce speakers and hope they keep to the time. They'll be pleased. <laughs> um, and look, let's try and get through all the speakers. Uh, as we didn't finish um, the, the programme from the last session, we're going to start with two personal testimonies. The first is from Hungary. So I'd like to invite Leon Horvath to take the floor. Leon. Jó napot kívánok! Szeretném megköszönni először, először is a meghívást, a nagy megtiszteltetés ez számomra. Horváth Leonnak hívnak. Évet nevelkedtem ö, állami nevelésben, édesapám öngyilkos lett, szülőanyám ö, elhanyagolt minket, így társai vagy ö, testvéreimmel ö, az ellátórendszerbe kerültünk. Kiskolomban ö, nagyon gyakran bántalmaztak, ö, előfordult az, hogy óráskolomban a fejemet a víz alá nyomták, amíg fúldokolni nem kezdtem. Ö, ezután sokáig ágyba vizeltem, majd a későbbiekben, 12-13 éves koromban az egyik nevelő élettársa ö, a lábamtól fogva a harmadik emeleti lépcsőfordulóból lelógatott, és azon nevetett, ahogyan sírok és ö, könyörgök, hogy ö, húzzon vissza. 
ezek után nekiálltam foglalkozni gyermekjoggal, illetve pszichológiával, és egyre több szabálytalanságot kezdtem el felfedezni az ellátórendszeren belül, illetve az intézményeken belül, amikre felhívtam a figyelmet. Nyilván ezen új hobbim nem nyert el sok ember tetszését, ezért nem kívánatos személyé váltam. Először lelkileg terrorizáltak, próbáltak megfélemlíteni. Én volt, úgy hívt, azt mondták, úgy, úgy hívtak, hogy én vagyok a sátán, dr. Hannibal Lecter, egy genetikai hulladék, egy roncs vagyok. Nyilván 13 évesen azért ez nagyon megviselt engem. De ennek ellenére ö, olyan, olyan ö, szinten folyt a kizsákmányolás velünk szemben a bántalmazás, illetve a szexuális visszaélések, hogy nem hagytam abba így a joggal való foglalkozást, és továbbra is adtam be különböző féle jogi nyilatkozatokat, beadványokat. Ennek az lett a következménye, hogy elhelyeztek egy speciális ö, otthonba, a, aminek a, az volt a célja, hogy elkülönítsenek... Ö, vagy hát jobban elkülönítsenek a külvilágtól, nehezebben tudjam felvenni a kapcsolatot különböző féle szervezetekkel, hivatalokkal. Egy olyan intézménybe helyeztek, ahol súlyos problémákkal küzdő fiatalok vannak, aktív szerfogyasztók, súlyos pszichés problémákkal küzdők, illetve deviás viselkedéssel küzdő gyermekek. Közel másfél évet nevelkedt, vagy nevelkedtem, éltem kényszerből itt, majd mivel már minden jogi lehetőségemet kimerítettem, polgári pert indítottam a kormányhivatal ellen, amelyet sikeresen meg is nyertem. A bíróság kimondta, hogy nem, hogy jogtalan volt az elhelyezés, de koholt alaptalan vádakat írtak le róla, illetve több szakvélemény sem felelt meg a valóságnak. Ezért jogerősen is megnyertem a, a, a pert, amit indítottam a kormányhivatal ellen. Ö, ennyit így röviden magamról. Ö, igazából én, mivel Magyarországról jöttem, nyilván a Magyarországon uralkodó állapotokról, ö, vagy a gyermekvédelemben uralkodó állapotokról kívánnék ö, pár mondatot mondani. Ö, sajnos én egy olyan országból jöttem, ö, vagy élek, ö, ahol igazából nem a kormány, az állam, hanem inkább civil társadalmi szervezetek látják el a gyermekvédelmet, vagy ők, ők segítik ezt, ami nyilván nagy problémát jelent. A másik, amit fontosnak tartok elmondani, a menekült gyermekekkel kapcsolatban. Uh, nyilván most Magyarországon uh, ez egy nagy problémát jelent, uh, a, ahogyan bánnak uh, az ottani menekült gyermekekkel, uh, és igazából uh, a, igazából az ő védelmükben, vagy a Bocsánat, nem szoktam ilyen helyeken beszélni, és egy picit zavarban vagyok, elnézést kérek. Igazából én most úgy nevezném magamat, hogy ilyen jogi aktivista, aki a gyermekvédelemmel foglalkozik, meg a menekült gyermekek jogaival. És egyszerűen csak arra szeretném felhívni a figyelmet, hogy, a, hogy sajnos az én országom egy olyan hely, ahol ezekkel a gyerekekkel, akik... Menekül, menekülésre kényszerültek, akiknek meghaltak a, 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 a családtagjaik, el kellett hagyniuk az otthonukat, igazából csak egy, egy életre, egy normális életre vágynak, ennek ellenére mi nálunk nem, hogy emberséges, emberséget kapnának, hanem szinte szó szerint börtönbe zárják őket, és ez, ez, ez felháborító, ez mellett, vagy ez, ez, ez fontosnak tartottam így elmondani, hogy tényleg úgy bánnak velük, mintha állatok lennének, elkerítik őket, pedig ugyanolyan emberek, mint mi. Fú, bocsánat. Köszönöm. 
Elég, ugye? Köszönöm. Köszönöm szépen a figyelmet. Thank you very, very much, Leon. Now I'd like to pass the floor to Gollum Reza Hasanpour, who will speak in Greek. Keep your headphones on and do not press the red button on the set in front of you. Um, and Gollum is from Afghanistan, but he's going to speak in Greek. So the floor is yours. Kalispera axiotimi kalismeni. Tonoma mine Hasanpour Gollum Reza. Και είμαι πρώην ασυνόδευτο ανήλικο. Σήμερα θα ήθελα να μοιραστώ μαζί σα την προσωπική μου εμπειρία, που αποτελεί και εμπειρία δεκάδων χιλιάδων ασυνόδευτων παιδιών σε όλο τον κόσμο. Γεννήθηκα στο Αφγανιστάν το 1990 και έφυγα για το Ιράν μαζί με την οικογένειά μου σε ηλικία 7 ετών. Το να μεγαλώσω στο Ιράν ω Αφγανό πρόσφυγα ήταν εξαιρετικά, ε, εξαιρετικά δύσκολο. Δεν είχαμε αρκετά χρήματα για οικονομική περίθαλψη ή να γραφτούμε στο σχολείο. Ακόμα και με άδεια παραμονή σε ισχύ, η οικογένεια μου ήταν σε υποσυνεχή απειλή για απέλαση. Εγώ ίδιο είχα συλληφθεί δύο φορέ και η οικογένεια μου είχε αναγκαστεί να δωροδοκήσει του αστυνομικού για να με αφήσουν ελεύθερο. Για ένα νέο άνθρωπο όπω εγώ, η απέλαση στο Αφγανιστάν σημαίνει σίγουρο θάνατο. Έτσι, υπό φόβο τη απειλή μια απέλαση σε μέρο όπου γνώριζα ότι δεν θα είμαι ασφαλή, αποφάσισα να εγκαταλείψω την οικογένειά μου πίσω στο Ιράν και να φύγω προ την Ευρώπη. Ήταν μια πολύ δύσκολη απόφαση να φύγω μόνο μου και να αφήσω όλη την οικογένεια μου πίσω. Τότε ήμουν μόνο 16 ετών. Χωρί όμω να είχα άλλη επιλογή, το 2005 ξεκίνησα το νέο μου ταξίδι μαζί με πέντε ακόμα φίλου, με στόχο να βρω ασφάλεια και προστασία. Ήταν ένα εξαιρετικά δύσκολο επικίνδυνο ταξίδι, όπου περισσότερε από μία φορά κόντεψα να χάσω τη ζωή μου. Και ξεκίνησα στα σύνορα Ιράν-Τουρκία που πληρώσαμε διακινητή για να μας οδηγήσει στη Τουρκία. Περπατήσαμε δέκα νύχτες, στη διάρκεια της μέρας κρυβόμασταν στις σπηλιές και τρύπες μέσα στα βουνά, για να μην μας πιάσουν. Τη τελευταία νύχτα, συνεροφύλακες πληρώσαν το καραβάνι μας. Δόθηκε εντολή από τους διακινητές να τρέξουμε και αυτοί μας εγκατάλειψαν. Ξεκίνησα να τρέχω τρομαγμένος, χωρίς να γνωρίσω πού πάω. Κάποια στιγμή στάθηκα σε ένα σημείο, κοιτώντας πίσω μου. Και συνειδητοποίησα ότι ήμουν μόνο μου. Φώναξα του φίλου μου, όμω δεν έπαιρνα καμία απάντηση. Στο τέλο βρήκα μόνο του τρει. Στη συνέχεια φωνάζαμε τα ονόματα των δύο άλλων φίλων μα που έλειπαν. Όμω οι διακινητέ, σημαντεύοντα τα όπλα του προ εμά, μα φώναζαν να σκάσουμε για να μην μα εντοπίσουν άλλιω, θα μα εσκότωναν. Έπειτα μα στηβάξανε 50 άτομα σε ένα μικρό φορτηγό που θα μα πήγαινε στη Τουρκία. Όμω μα εντόπισαν και μα συνέλαβαν οι Τούρκοι συνεροφύλακε. Μα οδήγησαν σε ένα στρατόπεδο και μα κράτησαν έξω, εκτιθυμένο σε βροχή και κρύο. Στη διάρκεια αυτών των ημερών μα έδινε ελάχιστο φαγητό. Ιδιαίτερα μια παγωμένη νύχτα, εκετεύαμε του στρατιώτε να μα επιτρέψουν να μείνουμε μέσα, γιατί κρυώναμε. Όμω αυτοί μα στόχοβαν με τα όπλα. Ήμασταν τόσο κουρασμένοι, παγωμένοι. Και είχαμε χάσει την ελπίδα μα, όπου ανοίξαμε τα χέρια μα και του παρακαλούσαμε να μα σκοτώσουν, προκειμένου να δώσουμε τέλο σε αυτό το μαρτύριο. Οι Τούρκοι συνεροφύλακε μα οδήγησαν πίσω στα σύνορα με το Ιράν και μα άφησαν εκεί. Γνωρίζαμε ότι στην περιοχή των σύνορων υπήρχαν ομάδε διακινητών που συλλαμβάνανε τον κόσμο και του κρατούσαν όμοιρου. Καταφέραμε μια ολόκληρη μέρα να του ξεφύγουμε. Όμω, πεινασμένοι και διψασμένοι όπω ήμασταν, αναγκαστήκαμε μέσα στην απελπισία μα να παραδοθούμε σε αυτού. Σε δρόμο με του διακινητέ με το φορτικό, οι Ιρανοί συνενοφύλακε πυροβολούσαν προ εμά. Νιώθαμε παγιδευμένοι. Είμαστε ήδη στα χέρια των διακινητών, με του Ιρανού συνενοφύλακε να μα πυροβολούν από μια πλευρά και με του Τούρκου συνενοφύλακε να μα απειλούν μια απέλαση από την άλλη. Σε ένα σπίτι που άνοιγε σε ένα από του διακινητέ, μα είπαν: Σα αγοράσαμε και χρειάζεται να μα ξεπληρώσετε για να σα αφήσουμε ελεύθερου. Του απαντήσαμε ότι δεν είχαμε χρήματα. Όμω ένα από του διακινητέ με άρπαξε, λέγοντα ότι σε αυτή την περίπτωση θα βασανίσουμε το μικρότερο μέχρι θάνατο. Τελικά, καταφέραμε να βρούμε χρήματα για την απελευθέρωσή μα και φτάσαμε στην Κωνσταντινούπολη. 
Οι τουρκικέ λιμινικέ αρχέ έκαναν περιπολία στη θάλασσα για να εντοπίσουν του ανθρώπου να φεύγουν. Καταφέραμε να επιβαστούμε σε επιφορτωμένη φουσκωτή βάρκα στη μέση τη νύχτα. Κανεί από εμά δεν ήξερε κολύμπη. Δεν είχα δει ποτέ θάλασσε ζωή μου. Πεινασμένοι, διψασμένοι και εξαντλημένοι κοπηλατούσαμε για πέντε ώρε έω ότου φτάσαμε στι ακτέ τη Ελλάδα. Μάθαμε ότι είμαστε στο νησί τη Λέσβου. Πήγαμε να παρτουθούμε στι αρχέ. Πίστευα ότι είχα φτάσει στην Ευρώπη κότε ύστερα από, από τη φρικτή ενό τόσο επικίνδυνου ταξιδιού. Επιτέλου θα μα δινόταν ένα ασφαλέ μέρο για να μείνουμε και θα είχα τη δυνατότητα να πάω σχολείο. Δεν είχα σκεφτεί ποτέ ότι θα με συλλάβουν και θα με κρατήσουν. Οι ελληνικέ λιμινικέ αρχέ μα έβαλαν σε ένα, σε ένα μικρό χώρο στο λιμάνι του νησιού, όπου μα απομόνωσαν κλείνοντα τι κουρτίνε. Μα έβαλαν στο τοίχο και μα ρωτούσαν τι στα αγγλικά. Έχετε χρήματα, έχετε κινητά τηλέφωνα, έχετε χαρτιά. Όταν απαντήσαμε αρνητικά, άρχισαν να μα εκτυπώνε σε γενετικά όργανα, επαναλαμβάνοντα συνεχώ τι ίδιε ερωτήσει. Μετά από κάποια ώρα, μα άφησαν ελεύθερου, δίνοντα μα εντολή να πάμε στο αστυνομικό τμήμα και να παραδοθούμε, σαν να ήμασταν κοινοί εγκληματίε. Περπατήσαμε δύο ώρε μέχρι να βρούμε το αστυνομικό τμήμα. Στο αστυνομικό τμήμα. Περιμένουν πολλέ ώρε, εξαντλημένοι, μέχρι που νύχτωσε. Μα είχαν με χειροπέδε και δεν μπορούσαμε να καταλάβουμε τι μα έλεγαν οι Έλληνε αστυνομικοί, καθώ δεν υπήρχε διερμηνέα. Στη συνέχεια, οι αστυνομικοί μα οδήγησαν στο κέντρο κράτηση, όπου παιδιά και ενήλικε κρα, κρατούνταν μαζί, σε άθλιε συνθήκε, πίσω από κάγκελα, όπω στη φυλακή. Αυτό το κέντρο κράτηση έχει πλέον κλείσει. Υπήρχε μόνο μία τουαλέτα και ένα μπάνιο 50 ανθρώπου. Μα επιτρόπονταν μόνο μία ώρα περίπου τη μέρα να ποραυλιστούμε και να κάνουμε μπάνιο με ζεστό νερό. Όμω μόνο οι ισχυρότεροι κατάφεραν να κάνουν μπάνιο μέσα σε αυτή την ώρα. Ήταν Νοέμβρη και έκανε πολύ κρύο. Θυμάμαι ότι χρησιμοποιούσα τη ρίσκα κουβέρτε για να ζεσταθώ. Δεν μα επιτρεπόταν καμία επικοινωνία με τι αρχέ ή κάποιον από έξω. Ούτε οι ίδιε οι αρχέ δεν μα επισκέφτηκε. Έμεινα σε αυτό το κέντρο για δύο εβδομάδε. Μα είπαν ότι θα παραμείνουμε εκεί μόνο για μία εβδομάδα, χωρί καμία άλλη εξήγηση. Ήμουν τυχερό σε σχέση με του άλλου, όπου παρέμειναν στο κέντρο για πολλού μήνε. Ύστερα από αυτή την εμπειρία, δεν θέλω να επιστρέψω ποτέ ξανά στη Λέσβο. Προσπαθώ να μην σκέφτομαι αυτή την περίοδο. Ύστερα από όλα αυτά τα παιδιά που περνούν, πόλεμου και επικίνδυνα ταξίδια, πώ είναι δυνατόν να του βάζετε σε κράτηση. Δεν είναι εγκληματίε. Η κράτηση δεν θα σταματήσει από το να έρχονται τα παιδιά στην Ευρώπη. Όταν οι άνθρωποι είναι σε απόγνωση, πάντα θα βρίσκουν τον τρόπο. Ύστερα από το τρομερό τρο... το αυτό το ταξίδι που είχα, που με σόκαρε ο τρόπο που με μεταχειρίστηκε η Ευρώπη μόλι έφτασα, νόμιζα ότι κάπω έτσι θα είναι η Ευρώπη. Όταν ξεκίνησα το ταξίδι αυτό, είχα σκοπό να πάω σε οποιαδήποτε χώρα τη Σκανδιναβία. Όμω από την κούραση και φόβο από το ταξίδι. Που είχα κάνει και λόγω έλλειψη χρημάτων, αποφάσισα να μείνω στην Ελλάδα. Κάποια στιγμή μου επιτράπηκε να πάω στην Αθήνα, όπου μοιραζόμουν ένα, ένα πολύ μικρό δωμάτιο με δέκα ακόμη Αφγανού και έπιασα δουλειά ω ράφτη. Δούλευα 12 ώρε τη μέρα. Όμω, μένοντα σε αυτέ τι συνθήκε για ένα χρόνο, συνειδητοποίησα ότι δεν είχα κάνει τόσο δρόμο και δεν είχα βάλει τη, τη ζωή μου σε κίνδυνο τόσε φορέ για να ζω με αυτόν τον τρόπο. Περισσότερο από όλα ήθελα να ζήσω, να πάω σχολείο, να κάνω πράγματα που κάθε νέο στην ηλικία μου ονειρεύεται να κάνει. Ήταν με επαφή με μια ελληνική μη κυβερνητική οργάνωση, οι οποίοι με βοήθησαν να μάθω ελληνικά, να, γρα... να γραφτώ στο σχολείο και σιγά σιγά ξεκίνησα να βρίσκω τον δρόμο μου. Περίμενα 7 χρόνια να εξεταστεί το έτοιμο ασύλο. Και τελικά, έπειτα από πολλά χρόνια, με υπομονή και πολύ προσωπική προσπάθεια, κατάφερα να αποκτήσω την ελληνική επικότητα. Τα τελευταία έξι χρόνια εργάζομαι ω διερμηνέα στο Ελληνικό Συμβούλιο του Πρόσφυγε, το οποίο παρέχει νομική και κοινωνική στήριξη σε ασυνόδευτου ανήλικου και άλλου ετούντε άσυλο και πρόσφυγε. Στο πλαίσιο τη εργασία μου, έχω επισκεφτεί διάφορα hot spots στην Ελλάδα, όπου τα παιδιά κρατούνται μαζί με του ενήλικου σε άθλιε συνθήκε. Και πολλά από τα hot spots είναι σαν κέντρα κράτηση. Έχω συναντήσει ασυνόδευτου ανήλικου μέσα σε αυτά τα να βρίσκονται σε κίνδυνο. Θα ήθελα να επισημάνω ότι σε όλη τη διάρκεια του ταξιδιού οι ζωέ των ασυνόδευτων ανηλίκων βρίσκονται σε εξαιρετικό κίνδυνο. Λαθρέμποροι, διακινητέ, συναρροφύλακε, αστυνομικοί, ακόμα και οι συνταξιώτε μα εκμεταλλεύονται. 
και όπου και αν πήγε έγινα μάρτυρα παιδιών που, που αποτελούσαν στόχο βία, εκμετάλλευση, κακοποίηση και βιασμού. Τα παιδιά δεν θα έπρεπε. Τα παιδιά δεν θα έπρεπε να περνούν ακόμη περισσότερα βάζοντα του σε κράτηση λόγω έλλειψη εγγράφων. Χρειάζεται να γίνει πολύ, ακόμα πολλή δουλειά, αν θέλουμε να γίνει πραγματική πρόοδο στο τομέα τη προστασία των ασυνόδευτων ανηλίκων. Έτσι, θα ήθελα να κλείσω τι παρατηρήσει μου με τρει συγκεκριμένε προτάσει, τι οποίε ελπίζω ότι το ΦΟΡΜ αυτό θα λάβει υπόψη. Πρώτον, σε όλε τι στιγμέ θα πρέπει να παρέχονται τα παιδιά επαρκή και κατάλληλη υποδοχή και φιλοξενία. Αυτό σημαίνει ότι πρέπει να μπει άμεσο τέλο σε κράτηση των παιδιών στο όνομα του διθέν εγκλήματο τη μετανάστευση. Τα παιδιά δικούνται κατάλληλη φροντίδα, προστασία και υποστήριξη. Όχι κλειστά κέντρα, hot spot και άλλε μορφέ μετα... μεταναστευτική κράτηση ή οπεδήποτε άλλη μορφή κράτηση για μετανάστε. Η κράτηση λόγω παρατυπή εισό... εισόδου ποτέ δεν συμ... συμβάλλει. Στο, βε, στο βέλτιστο συμφέρον των παιδιών. Δεύτερον, είναι εξαιρετικά σημαντικό να υπάρχουν έμπειροι επαγγελματίε για την προστασία των ανηλίκων σε όλα τα σημεία εισόδου και τη διαδρομή του στην εκατοστέτη χώρα υποδοχή, οι οποίοι να εξασφαλίζουν το βέλτιστο συμφέρον του και κάθε συνόδευση ανήλικο να βρίσκεται υπό την υποπτία επιτρόπου ορισμένου από το κράτο. Εξειδικευμένοι επαγγελματίε για την προστασία ανηλίκων, όχι αστυνομικοί ούτε συνενοφυλακέ, θα έπρεπε να λάβουν απόφαση για το βελτιστό συμφέρον των ασυνόδευτων παιδιών. Τέλο, είναι απόλυτο αναγκαίο οι ανήλικοι να έχουν πρόσβαση σε θεμελιώδει υπηρεσίε όπω η διερμηνεία, η ψυχολογική υποστήριξη, η εκπαίδευση, η υγεία και στι δικασίε ασύλου. Ακόμη, θα έπρεπε να, να υπάρχουν επαγγελματίε που θα λειτουργούσαν ως προστατική τύχη και ως δια, διαμεσολαβητέ ανάμεσα στα παιδιά και τις αρχές. Παιδιά συνόδευτα δεν θα, ζη, δεν θα ζητήσουν ποτέ βοήθεια αν γνωρίζουν ότι μπορεί να συλληφθούν, κρατηθούν ή απειληθούν μικρά απέλαση. Σας ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ που με ακούσατε με προσεχή και εύχομαι μέσα από τα λόγια μου να ακούσετε και η φωνή όλων των ασυνόδευτων ανηλίκων, ελπίζω σε ένα μέλλον όπου κανένα παιδί δεν θα, χρει... δεν θα χρειάζεται να είναι μόνο, μόνο του για οποιοδήποτε λόγο. Many, many thanks, Gollum. I did not believe you could manage all that in the time allocated, but you did. And as a very slow, long-time learner of the Greek language, I have to say I'm very impressed with your Greek as well. Uh, thank you. I would now like to pass the floor to Mr. Simon Mordew, who is the Deputy Director General for Migration, in, uh, Director General for Migration and Home Affairs. Simon. Thank you, Margaret. Um, Leon Gollum, you've set a hell of a task making my presentation as compelling, uh, capturing the attention of the audience as yours were, and um, I praise both of you for your courage. I think it was very impressive. Um, I wanted to share with you a few thoughts on how we've been trying to approach what I would call the migration crisis over the last couple of years from the perspective of unaccompanied minors, from the perspective of children. The first thing I would say is often when we're faced with such a crisis, those who perhaps face the most challenging times, the most difficult times, are the most vulnerable, and that means in particular children. And I think it's in this context that I very much welcome the opportunity to come and talk to you all this evening, because I think last year's forum in particular was a very good example of how it helped us on the Commission side in crystallizing some of our thinking on the communication on protecting children in migration, which came out shortly after the forum, um, in April of this year. And there what we tried to do in this communication was just have a look. Where are we? What are the kind of protection gaps we've got? And what can we do and what can we encourage our member states to do to try and reinforce the protection of the uh, migrant children in particular? And I thought I could try and share with you a bit this evening uh, some of the dilemmas, some of the challenges we face, where we've got to and some of the areas where we still need work. 
I think one of the things that came out very strongly uh, last year, and I've had discussions with a number of you present in the audience over the last few months, is how much we still need to do towards creating really effective alternatives to the detention of children in migration. And that was one of the things we um, flagged as a priority action in the communication. I think we also have to look at how we are working in this. We're bound by quite stringent requirements flowing from the EU Charter, also the rulings of the European Court of Human Rights. And this means quite clearly that deprivation of liberty of migrant children is only in line with EU law in a few and very exceptional cases. It cannot be a frontline mainstream policy option. What we are still seeing on the ground, and I think your testimony was a very good example of that, is that we still see the reality on the ground continues often to be in stark contrast with the relatively high level of protection which is guaranteed by EU law. Now, the causes, they're not difficult. I think they're quite well known. We openly flagged them in the communication of April. In some instances, what we see is migrant children are being accommodated in closed facilities due to a shortage of suitable accommodation. Um, often it's because there are simply not workable alternatives available in a given member state to the detention of children. We, on our side as the Commission, we do have a role as guardian of treaties. We have been repeatedly uh, in dialogue with member states and have underlined, let me be clear on this, that the shortage or lack of appropriate accommodation and or the absence of alternatives to detention in national legislation or policy, that cannot be seen as an excuse or a legitimate reason to resort to the detention of migrant children. The situation is mixed, uh, and one of the things we also have to do is monitor compliance with the existing protection standards. How do we do this? Just to give you an example, we use a tool which we call the Schengen Evaluation Mechanism. This is visits of um, member states officials, often accompanied actually by specialists from the Fundamental Rights Agency with knowledge in this area, to look at how the legislation is being applied effectively on the grounds. We also, frankly, when that doesn't work, we do make use of what we call infringement proceedings, bringing member states to court um, regarding the treatment of minors. We've done this on issues such as ineffective guardianship provisions, on inadequacy of reception conditions. Uh, Leon spoke about his experience of the experience of migrant children in Hungary. That's one of the infringement cases that is in the pipeline at the moment on the transit zones when the, where the detention of children for an indefinite period clearly does not correspond with um, EU legislation. I would actually go so far as to say actually with EU values as well, but that's a personal opinion. Um, but I do think here, and here I want to perhaps be a bit provocative and, and challenge some of you in the audience, I do think we have to also put our discussions of today and tomorrow in a broader context. And what I mean by that is I don't want to give a free pass to, to, to all of the member states, but I do think we, it's important we acknowledge the tremendous challenges and pressure that some of the frontline member states have been facing where shortages and absence of alternatives are part of that broader picture and not helped at times by an absence of solidarity from other member states. And I think, therefore, what I would encourage everybody in the next day or two is I think it's our duty not only to diagnose but also to think about how can we help member states to face the pressure in any way needed which can also help and protect the best interests of the child. And I wanted to spell out to you a bit this evening, very shortly, one or two things that we've been trying to do with some of our agencies. Well, one of the things we've been doing with agencies such as the European Asylum Support Office, with the European Border and Coast Guard Agency, is offer quite concrete logistic and financial support to work together with member states to improve the situation at the hotspots, 
which actually do serve a purpose that is positive in the sense of at a time of a crisis, at the time of pressure, they're there to ensure that the interests of those arriving are put in the forefront with medical help, psychologically counselling available. And the work we've been doing with member states on this is designed to make that this experience is automatic and not necessarily Gollum's experience is a mainstream experience that everybody arriving in a hotspot should encounter. But we've also been working with member states to improve mainstream reception facilities, looking at alternative care pathways, uh, working to ensure that we have qualified assistance of any sort, the kind of assistance needed for migrant children, working in particular in Greece and Italy to try and reinforce the guardianship systems of the member states uh, where needed and supporting education integration programs as well. And I think if we look ahead to the next period of the budget of the European Union, ensuring there's much more support available for the integration of new arrivals within the European Union has to be one of our major priorities and challenge. I would argue that the, the investment in a child's future and the investment in integration from a new arrival within the European Union is far less than the cost of non-integration. And I deliberately use those terms, investment and cost, in that sense. Now, the last point I, I, I really wanted to make as well is I think it's very important when we talk about any EU or international commitments concerning children that what is clear is that what should be guiding us and what does guide us is the principle of the child's best interest. This is a right that's enshrined in the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights and in the EU Asylum and Migration Law. And I think even when one looks at a migration policy that sometimes faces competing priorities, EU law explicitly mentions the best interests of the child in each and every piece of relevant EU migration legislation. And I think the worst that we sometimes see is that, and the worst that can actually happen to a migrant child, is that they're often falling through the cracks of a procedure and find himself, herself in a legal limbo. And I think this is particularly drastic for a child where time is of the essence and such a child who is prevented from having access to services, in particular health care, in particular education, they cannot grow, they cannot integrate, and there's also a risk, frankly, in certain cases of seeing radicalisation as well. And I think such precarious situations are often exploited and place the children also at the risk of falling prey to the criminal networks, often the same networks that have been participating in their smuggling to the European Union in the first place and continue to exploit them through the illegal employment of child, the exploitation of the child once they've arrived in the um, European Union. And I think this for us is why probably one of the biggest challenges we face is how do we find or how can we put in place a comprehensive management of migration, looking at it from all the different aspects, but also finding alternatives that work an, as an urgent priority. We've got to try and balance, if you like, the best interests of the child, but also the interest of the European Union as a whole in effective migration management, including the migration of children. And I think just to end on detention, where we started, I think that is why the detention of children should only be resorted to in very exceptional circumstances and one of the key priorities I think for many member states is now investing in much much more to also find suitable but also effective alternatives to this and I think this again if your work of the next two days in this forum is one area where I think you'll be able to make an important contribution to this regard. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Simon, and indeed we're very glad to have with us here at the Forum some of the Asylum, Migration and Integration Fund Managing Authority representatives, so very important people over the next two days. The next speaker is Thomas Bocek, who is the Council of Europe's Special Representative of the Secretary-General on um, Migration and Refugees, but Thomas has a different mandate today. He will be covering all the Council of Europe activities with regard to children deprived of their liberty. Thank you, Margaret. Colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I will not start with a surprising 
uh, statement by rather just saying the obvious, that detention is stressful and sometimes dangerous. It is synonym to, to physical, emotional and intellectual isolation. It is difficult for adults and even more so for children. With the current migration flows towards Europe, public opinion has been very concerned with child immigration detention and my presence here today, in fact, in the capacity of the Council of Europe's Special Representative for Migration and Refugees, is just another confirmation. Nevertheless, it is imperative uh, to keep in sight all children deprived of liberty or with imprisoned parents. And in this sense, I really commend the choice of, of the topic uh, for this year's Forum on the Rights of the, of the Child. Uh, in this context, and again with the risk of stating the, uh, the obvious, it is beyond any doubt that detention is almost never in the best interest of the child, and if applied, it should be only as a measure of last resort and for the shortest possible time. Just as obvious is that alternatives to detention are safer, less expensive, and effective measures to implement state criminal, Im immigration, and social policies. Let me share with you today what we do in the Council of Europe and what we think should be done to reach these objectives in areas covered by this forum. And it is, of course, encouraging to notice that standards and the action of the Council of Europe have been mentioned several times during the pre-event of this conference as relevant and up to help improving the situation. So the starting point of our reflection of our work in the areas, uh, these areas are the regular findings by our monitoring bodies that children, including juveniles, are at particular risk of violence, sexual exploitation and abuse, trafficking and ill treatment when they are deprived of their liberty. This is confirmed every time we go in fact finding or monitoring visits in police stations, prisons, immigration detention centers, psychiatric hospitals or social care homes. When it is a question of children in conflict with the law, the Council of Europe works towards preventing deprivation of liberty. The European Court of the Human Rights has repeatedly emphasized that the standards for demonstrating the need for detention in accordance with Article 5, which is the right of, uh, to liberty and security, are higher than when adults are concerned. The Court has confirmed that pretrial detention of minors should only be used as a measure of last resort and be as short as possible. The Strasbourg Court and the Committee for Prevention of Torture, uh, CPT, have long advocated that all detained juveniles who are accused or convicted of a criminal offence should be held in detention centres designed for people of this age, offering a non-prison-like environment and regimes tailored to their specific needs and staffed by professionals trained in dealing with the young. Even so, the CPT continues to receive allegations of police ill-treatment of juveniles, slaps, punches, kicks of blows with buttons at the time of apprehension and subsequent questioning in police stations. In this connection, the CPT called for a maximum of 24 hours a juvenile can stay in police custody. The 2010 Council of Europe guidelines on child-friendly justice and the 2017 help e-learning course of child-friendly justice have been instrumental in promoting the understanding that first, detention in whatever form need to be avoided as much as possible and should be restricted to serious cases only. And second, that alternatives to judicial proceedings such as mediation, diversion and alternative dispute resolution should be encouraged whenever this may, may best serve the child's best interests. Let me say a few words about the immigration detention of children. And I am pleased to report the significant work undertaken by the Council of Europe concerning child immigration detention since my presentation last year before this forum. Within the Council of Europe, there is a concerted effort to promote effective alternatives to detention and to identify standards for immigration detention. The intergovernmental working groups have not yet completed their work but we expect that the resulting documents will provide member states with guidance in using alternatives, with standards for material conditions of detention and procedures which, which should help assess the proportionality of the detention measures. 
This work seeks to put in practice uh, the findings of the Strasbourg Court, which, among others, has called for a necessity test for children's immigration detention. According to this test, if the same aim can be achieved by other means, then detention would be incompatible with the Convention. In May this year, the 47 member states of the Council of Europe pledged support for the action plan on protecting refugee and migrant children in Europe. And uh, reducing resort to detention of children solely on the basis of their immigration status and encouraging implementation of alternatives to detention are two objectives at the heart of the action plan. Over a month ago, I attended the conference organized in Prague by the Czech Chairmanship of the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe on ending immigration detention of children. The conference discussed, on one hand, the negative effects of immigration detention on children and, on the other hand, alternatives to detention. One of the conclusions of the conference was that we need an alliance of actors that will push for change. And I believe that EU Forum on the Rights of the Child is instrumental in fostering such an alliance for all areas involving child deprivation of liberty. And I call on everyone here to join this alliance and to make changes possible. There has been some progress in recent, year, in recent years in ensuring that children are held in separate juvenile-only units in ordinary prisons or detention centres. Many states have passed legislation on alternatives to penal or administrative detention. However, more should and must be done. What more? In Prague, we discussed the availability of different procedures that are linked to the decision to deprive children of their liberty. Child-friendly procedures, availability of protection safeguards like age assessment, guardianship, alternative measures. If these other procedures work, many migrant and refugee children will not have to be detained at all. States should not stop at enacting laws on alternatives. They should be encouraged and assisted to put in place processes for the selection of the most appropriate alternative or combination of alternatives for each case, criminal or administrative. And this requires concerted efforts from different categories of professionals, lawyers, social workers, psychologists, probation and mediation officers. It requires a coordinated approach and sharing of good practices. It cannot happen without engagement and trust. Ladies and gentlemen, a special category of children deprived of their liberty includes those placed in institutions as a consequence of disability, mental health or, or drug abuse for, drug educa for education or rehabilitation purposes. The Council of Europe Human Rights Commission expressed serious concerns at the continuing existence of large segregated facilities for children with disabilities throughout Europe and called on Council of Europe member states to move from institutions to arrangements relying on community-based services. The Council of Europe standards in this field promote desinstitutionalization and community living of children with disabilities. We also provide standards on child-friendly social care and on the rights of children in residential care. In addition, we promote alternative forms of care. So standards are in place, but they need to be applied more thoroughly. It is common ground for Council of Europe member states that the existence of a disability as ground for involuntary confinement amounts to arbitrary deprivation of liberty and constitutes discrimination. The Strasbourg Court has repeatedly revealed deficiencies in the legal framework in the medical and social care of children and young people in residential institutions. We are currently assisting member states in improving these deficiencies by supporting appropriate legal reforms and better access to remedies. Let me add a final comment on the situation of children with imprisoned parents or infants staying in prison with their parent. These children are entitled to the same rights as all other children the right to family and maintaining contact with the parent being the most important one. <coughs> Nevertheless, today, very few countries in Europe are taking steps to thwart the negative effects of parental imprisonment on children. In to the total number of children in the 47 
Council of Europe member states who have one or more parents in prison is estimated at more than 2 million on any given date. If no adequate measures are taken to counter the trauma parental imprisonment causes, states will ultimately have to attend to the serious health, educational and integration problems these children may have to face later in life. Respecting the rights of these children by adjusting the prison system to them is not enough. What is needed is reconsidering national penal policies in order to allow for a more efficient use of alternatives to custody. Multidisciplinary and multi-agency approach when offering support and assistance to prisoners and their families. You may be aware that the Council of Europe is currently finalizing work on a recommendation addressing the situation of these children. The document urges national authorities to take measures to support these children and to improve their prospects for positive development and for successful social inclusion. And we believe it has a potential to become a tool which will further help to better the chance of a positive childhood for these children. Ladies and gentlemen, I provided you with a snapshot of uh, what the Council of Europe does. Our work reflects a determined shift toward findings, finding effective alternatives to, to deprivation of liberty for children, alternative forms of care, and when detention or institutionalization is really unavoidable to ensure that the best interest of the child is at the core of each and every effort. We are all aware that the road will be long, and we are all aware that, important, that as important as it is to have good laws and common standards, ending in children's detention depends also on other factors, awareness raising, work with media, capacity building, resources and training, and above all, on the political will and on an alliance of like-minded actors that are willing to invest in long-term solutions. The Council of Europe standards, along, along with EU and international standards, should be our guide and we shall not fail. In fact, we cannot afford to fail. Let us never forget that it is easier to build a strong future today than to try to repair a broken present tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. And you also, like Simon, got brownie points for finishing early. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Sandy Blanchet, who is the recently appointed director of the UNICEF Office for Relations with the EU. Sandy, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, their colleagues and friends. On behalf of UNICEF, I would, leave, I would like to thank the EU and particularly DG Justice for giving UNICEF an opportunity uh, to be part again of this ongoing dialogue between uh, the EU governments, civil society, international organizations, uh, children and young people on how we can better protect children's rights together. Um, I know that here all of us agree that depriving children of their liberty is not in their best interest, and we've heard many speakers saying this before. And I think that we are all committed to work hard until, uh, to, put, to prevent the deprivation of uh, liberty, to put in place alternatives, and actually in simple words, to end this practice. Now we know that the figures are not uh, very reliable, but it's still good to remember because even if they are underestimates, they are quite shocking. We know that there are at least 80 million children who live in institutions today and over 1 million who live behind bars. And these numbers seem quite large, but they actually are underestimates because, as it was explained before, it is difficult to get um, reliable data. And that's why we think that uh, getting better and more data and analysis is absolutely key to this effort. Um, and we support, from that point of view, we support Professor Novak's study, and, and we are proud to be part of the high-level committee. Now, what we do know is that children can find themselves deprived of liberty 
as a result of a juvenile justice measure, because of their migration status, because of decisions made about their care, and sometimes as a result of factors that have nothing to do with children, for instance, the status of their parents. Every government in this room and every government in the European Union has ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Article 37 of the Convention requires that deprivation of liberty occurs at a measure of last resort and in the context of a juvenile justice decision. And there are international norms, that, such as the Beijing Rules and the Riyadh Guidelines, that actually establish very high um, threshold for the use of deprivation of liberty in the context of juvenile justice. What is interesting is that the Convention does not really envisage that children can be deprived or should be deprived of liberty outside of that context. And so any measure, any uh, deprivation of liberty of children outside of the juvenile justice context is a violation of their rights. And it's a violation of not only one right, but many of them. Article 3 on the best interests of the child. Article 9 on the right to a family life. Article 19 on the right to be protected from violence. Articles 28 and 29 on the right to education and development. Because child rights are indivisible, very often when you violate one right, you actually violate many of them. Now these are all the legal arguments, but there are others why, we should, why deprivation of liberty is never in the best interest of a child. And I would like to highlight a couple of issues. One of them is violence against children. And here Marta Santos Pais talked very eloquently about it, so I will not uh, repeat what, what, what she said. But we have to remember that in um, prisons, closed institutions, detention centers, violence is almost always present. The corporal punishment in institutions is not explicitly prohibited in the majority of countries. Staff are poorly trained. They think they discipline children by beating them, beating them with their hands, sticks, hoses, attaching them to furniture, banging their heads against the wall. It's, I mean, these are words that are very hard to pronounce, but that's the reality of these kids today that are not uh, outside in our society, in our communities, and in a family environment. But even when there is no violence, Deprivation of liberty per se is, uh, negatively impacts children. And we have many studies showing that deprivation of liberty or children living in institutions, this has long-lasting negative in impact on their physical, emotional, mental, psychological, and intellectual development and well-being. And when this impacts children, it impacts societies and communities. These long-term effects can include severe development, uh, develop, developmental delays, disability, psychological damage, poor health, and even early death. And it increases the rate of suicide, violence, and recidivism. We are particularly concerned by the institutionalization of very young children because the impact on their very young bodies and brains is even more damaging for older children. We have research showing that for every three months that a young child spends in an institution, they lose one month of development. So think about these kids who spend their whole life in an institution. Now, it's very important to talk about solution because we don't want to be only talking about the problem. We want to say there are other options, they are cost effective, they exist, they have proven to work. And I would like to talk about the solutions in the context of juvenile justice, migration, and uh, child care system. Last year, in the context of juvenile justice, last year UNICEF supported directly juvenile justice reforms in 81 countries in Africa, Asia, Europe, Latin America, and the Middle East. It shows how uh, widespread both the problem is, but also that there is willingness to address this problem. And in every single country, the priority is to reduce the number of children deprived of liberty and to promote diversion and alternative measures. And this works. For example, in Georgia, the government recently introduced diversion and probation schemes as sentencing options. 
and only within one year, over 200 uh, children avoided criminal procedures and sentences. In the Republic of Moldova, roughly three quarters of all children sentenced by a judge now receive a probation or community work opposed to prison. In 2015, we produced together with the EU a joint evaluation of our work in Central and Eastern Europe between 2006 and 2012. And the findings of this study were very positive. In just six years, and, and six years in terms of reforms of systems is a, is a very short time. So in just six, to, six years, because of extensive work on justice for children reforms, uh, reforms that were led by government and supported by um, the EU, UNICEF, civil society and other partners, the number of detained children decreased by 60%. So it is uh, quite a remarkable impact. And this decrease was partly due to the development and use of diversion and alternative measures, as well as the training of judges and prosecutors, so that they could understand that um, the, uh, they can understand the detrimental effects of detention and the positive outcomes that children can uh, achieve through non-custodial measures. Now we know that the deprivation of uh, children of liberty is both um, it's an invisible problem. I think the speaker said it before. We don't talk much, it doesn't get a lot of media attention. And when it does, it's a very sensitive and political issue. And we meet uh, sometimes electoral, uh, elected officials and civil servants who are convinced that children should not uh, be deprived of liberty. But they don't know how to do it. They don't know how to sell it. They say, you know, that's what people want. That's what works. So we need to help them build political consensus when this uh, approach, that is a human rights-based approach, is, is difficult. And that's important. Reforms of juvenile justice systems require information campaigns designed to build public support for non-punitive approaches towards young offenders. And this could be said in other contexts that are also politically sensitive. When we offer judges and prosecutors concrete alternatives to detention, uh, diversion mechanism, it works, but we need to mobilize a range of stakeholders, probation officers, NGOs, social workers, trained counselors, and mediation officers. And here there is no model that, you know, one size fits all. Um, These uh, models need to be adapted to each country. The elements might be slightly different and combined in a different manner. But we know from our work, the work of UNICEF together with the EU and our partners, we know that when um, Decision makers are committed to make these reforms of the juvenile justice system. Children who have come into conflict with the law can be kept out of detention, while at the same time receiving supervision and support to address the factors that contributed to their offending. So I would like now to turn to the second context, which is the detention of children for migra immigra immigration uh, control purposes. Here, the Committee on the Rights of the Child clearly stated that the detention of children for migration control is never in their best interest. In UNICEF, we fully support this position. As a member of the Child Rights in the Global Compacts Initiative, we work with partners to ensure that the upcoming Global Compacts on Refugees and Migrants follow the New York Declaration on Refugees and Migrants and, con and contain concrete commitments by states to end the use of immigration detention against children. And actually, we have already seen some progress in many countries, including uh, in the European Union, particularly for separated and unaccompanied children. One of the challenges now is to extend, expand these solutions also uh, to, to children who are with their, with their families, including for those children and families who have been identified for return uh, or removal from a territory. At the global level, the um, normative framework supporting the non-detention of children, mi child migrants is developing. But also at the national um, level, we see some, uh, l some progress. Ireland has completely prohibited uh, immigration detention of children. And although in Spain, Portugal and Italy, legislation still allows for it, in practice it's not used. Uh, interestingly, one of the main reasons why it's not used in these countries is because detention costs too much, and alternatives to detention cost less money. 
So UNICEF, together with other um, international organizations such as UNHCR um, and the Fundamental Rights Agency, have documented examples showing that it's possible to operate community-based supervision schemes for migrant families, even for those who are in the last stages of return processes, and at the same time keep very high rates of compliance with decisions. So we can balance the best interests of the society, in some cases that is to control migration, and the best interests of the child. And these alternatives are on average, as I said, more cost effective than traditional detention models. Um, there is the case of Sweden, the case of the Netherlands that have very uh, good practices and, and I hope they will be shared during these uh, this next two days. <coughs> now one group of children that often is overlooked when we talk about the uh, deprivation of liberty is children in institutions. For the past 25 years, UNICEF has been working with governments, parliaments, civil society and families in Europe and other, on other continents to reduce the number of children placed in institutional care. And our experience shows that for most of these children, actually for all of these children, family and community-based care options can be found. Now, it requires for countries to invest, invest in developing um, child protection systems, social welfare, social protection services, and to get these services to work together with the health and education services. But in Bulgaria and Croatia, the number of children in institutions has decreased dramatically. Uh, in count some countries in the EU, the uh, law prohibits the institutionalization of children under three. In Ukraine and in Romania, governments are testing now community-based integrated social services to support families with, a risk, uh, with children at risk of separation. So the idea is to even, even identify children before they get um, at risk of being in an institution. And we have again proof that these services, be it alternatives to institutionalization or prevention of institutionalization, these services are more cost effective and of course they are in the best interest of children um, and communities and families. Um, and so in conclusion, I want to talk, talking about solutions, because I have one minute left, I want to say that we see some uh, common trends. These alternatives to deprivation of liberty, no matter what the context is, have strong communalities. First, they are community-based. Second, they are built around the needs and rights of individual children. So every child has the right to have his or her needs assessed and taken into account. Third, they depend on a network of trained professionals in child protection and social welfare. And fourth, it requires actually all the services around children, health, education, and social protection to come together and work together to protect children. Now, these uh, uh, services and these solutions can be combined differently according to the, to the context. And so finally, I really would like to join the uh, calls of previous speakers and call on all EU institutions and EU member states, first to respect their commitment under international human rights law including the EU Charter on Fundamental Rights, and to respect their European values. I think we should not be afraid of using these words. EU institutions and member states should strengthen legal and institutional instruments to prevent deprivation of, children, of, of liberty of children and support alternatives. The global compacts that are being negotiated are, provide such an opportunity for the EU to take the lead in promoting human rights and promoting the human rights of children. In Europe, in the past 30, 40 years, all countries in the European Union have eliminated death penalty. We strongly believe that the same can be done with the deprivation of liberty of children. And so we will continue to work with governments, professionals, civil society, international organizations, and local communities to identify the best solutions to ensure that deprivation of a child's liberty becomes a practice of the past. Thank you. Many thanks, Sandy. Our next speaker is Sophie McGuinness, who is the head of unit for policy and legal support in UNHCR's Bureau for Europe. Sophie, um, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much, uh, Margaret. Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to start by expressing my appreciation to the European Commission for convening this forum on the rights of the child and for inviting UNHCR to participate. UNHCR is the UN's refugee agency, so I'm going to confine my comments to children uh, in immigration-related detention. The topic of this forum is very timely given the ongoing challenges facing refugee, migrant and stateless children and the need to implement practical solutions that give effect to the best interests of the child. I'd like to particularly thank Leon and Golam for their excellent presentations right at the start. I think that both of you highlighted how important the challenges are that we're facing in Europe and how important it is that we find solutions uh, so that the things that have happened to you and that are currently happening to other unac um, unaccompanied minors in Europe will stop uh, and, and will not happen again. Recently, our High Commissioner for Refugees was on mission in Hungary. Uh, he visited detention centres there and he had the opportunity to meet with uh, an unaccompanied minor from Afghanistan who was detained at the border there in Hungary and he was quite clear that that detention should not have been happening and was able to make some, some solid public statements in relation to that. I think the personal testimonies that you both brought uh, were extremely powerful in bringing home why this is so important and why it's important we make progress on advocacy to end detention. In a world where nearly 20 people are forcibly displaced every minute as a result of conflict and persecution, we are witnessing the highest levels of displacement on record. Although developing regions host 84% of the world's refugees, we do still have protection challenges in Europe, which I've just spoken about. We continue to see pushbacks at borders, violence, restrictive asylum legislation, and poor reception conditions. And of particular concern are the situation of unaccompanied minors and the high incidence of sexual and gender-based violence. I think this forum is also quite timely because it comes hot on the heels of the European Commission's recent communication in April and a number of other measures that are currently in play and being discussed uh, where we hope to make good progress on some of these issues. Collectively, we have an obligation to take urgent action to ensure the children on the move are protected and to secure solutions that will enable them to build peaceful and productive lives. Millions of today's refugee parents were once refugee children themselves. Refugee status is often transmitted from parent to child owing to solutions being unavailable. If we do not act now together to find solutions for today's refugees and other displaced populations, we risk this generation of children and those to come. This is not a one country or a one agency issue. The protection and solutions needs of children on the move can only be addressed effectively through cooperation among a wide range of actors, governments, national and international organizations, civil society, the private sector, and most importantly, children on the move themselves and their communities. The need to foster further solidarity is one aspect that permeates all the key points that I want to raise today. In 2016, children constituted 51% of the total refugee population globally, up from 41% in 20, 2009, or 2009. Most girls and boys on the move are fleeing conflict, violence and extreme poverty. They also face a number of protection risks during their travel within countries and across borders, including exposure to trafficking, violence and exploitation, sexual and gender-based violence and the risk of statelessness. And we heard about all of those risks from Gollum earlier today. Vulnerability factors vary from birth to adolescence and the transition to adulthood from child protection programs should take into account any ongoing vulnerability. Given this context, it is paramount that an overall ethic of care and not enforcement needs to govern interactions with children on the move. Regardless of the circumstances and the reasons they are on the move, all children share two fundamental characteristics. One, they are children and should first and foremost be treated as such. And two, as children, they are entitled to special protection and assistance under the Convention on the Rights of the Child and their best interests should always be a primary consideration. Child protection is a key priority for UNHCR. 
last year the high commissioner's dialogue was specifically devoted to the issue of children on the move bringing together a broad spectrum of child protection experts states and other organisations to look at solutions. unhcr then called on states to end the harmful practice of detention of children for migration purposes. children should not be detained for immigration related purposes irrespective of their legal or migratory status or that of their parents. Detention is never in their best interests in this context. And let's remember that seeking asylum is not an unlawful act. Asylum seekers, including asylum seeking and refugee children and children and families, should not be penalised for exercising this right. This applies equally to unaccompanied and separated children whose age is in doubt. This does not mean, however, that states cannot take reasonable measures to ensure national security or in order to ensure that both adult and child asylum seekers can be properly identified, registered and their international protection claims processed. However, these reasonable measures, though they can include restrictions on movement when appropriate, can only happen in the context of alternatives to detention or childcare placements in a childcare setting. I would say that we agree fully with uh, what Simon raised earlier about the need to really identify appropriate measures and alternatives to detention that work in practice. Uh, we really have to come up with more examples and good evidence of the kinds of measures that can work in practice. And we also have to be very aware of the relationship between the lack of appropriate childcare places and appropriate <laughs> settings uh, and detention. And this has to end. If we look, for example, in Greece, we have unaccompanied children seeking asylum who are currently in detention in Greece. And the reason for that, if you dig behind it, is that there are not sufficient numbers of placement opportunities for unaccompanied and separated uh, children seeking asylum. And I fully agree with Simon uh, from the European Commission that detention can never be an option that is resorted to because of a lack of appropriate placements. So we have to put those uh, placements in place and we need to make sure that we provide the evidence on alternatives to detention so that states can take those up and end detention once and for all. In August this last year, UNHCR released, released a baseline and progress report on our global strategy uh, towards an end to detention. That progress report sets out the main achievements so far and highlights some encouraging progress in ending detention in a number of target countries. And I won't dwell on this because Sandy uh, did a very good job of explaining what some of those uh, good uh, progresses are. I would also like to recall that in 2015, UNHCR released a paper entitled Options for Governments on Care Arrangements and Alternatives to Detention for Children and Families. Uh, we have hard copies of the document available here at the forum at the back of the room. UNHCR, together with partners, continues to urge states to explore the use of, alter of alternatives to detention where appropriate, preferably through family-based care options or other suitable alternative care arrangements. Clear standards and procedures are vital to ensuring alternative reception and care arrangements protect children and do not cause harm. It is also crucial to stipulate that alternatives to detention are non-custodial and must not become alter alternative forms of detention. They should respect the principle of minimum intervention and fulfil the best interests of the child along with his or her rights to liberty and family life. I also want to briefly mention that among former asylum seekers and migrants who are detained in Europe are stateless persons. They are at particular risk of prolonged and repeat detention since they do not have a country to return to as no country sees them as citizens. In this regard, it should be flagged that UNHCR has now launched a tool to help practitioners. Uh, the tool is called Stateless Persons in Detention, a tool for their identification and enhanced protection, and hard copies of that document are also available here in the room. In December last year, we set out some proposals for Europe entitled Better Protecting Refugees in Europe and Globally. These proposals draw on the lessons of 2015 and 2016 and build on the European Commission's proposal for reform of the common European asylum system. Uh, those uh, proposals are currently being discussed. 
we welcome the strengthened provisions in some of those measures regarding children. Um, however, we would like to see the provisions go further and we have proposed that what we should have in place in Europe is a comprehensive child first approach driven by the principle of the best interests of the child, that particular attention be devoted to unaccompanied and separated children and a common approach would require a number of elements. First of all, we need early identification and registration of asylum seeking children including referral to an age appropriate first reception for unaccompanied and separated children. We need the conduct of a multidisciplinary best interest assessment with priority for family reunion following a best interest assessment and the best interest determination. We need a strong solutions oriented component which would include local integration, family reunification or return to the country of origin if that is in the best interest of the child. And we need the immediate appointment of a guardian for unaccompanied uh, minors and children on the move. Uh, we see some good proposals from, that, from the European Commission uh, and we want to see those guardians appointed without any delay. In addition, we need prevention and response programs against sexual and gender-based violence towards children. And combined with enhanced EU coordination, we consider that these proposals would better ensure that children do not abscond or go missing while also ensuring their protection. In conclusion, I would like to recall that the New York Declaration for Refugees and Migrants agreed to only last year in New York by the UN General Assembly is a political commitment of unprecedented force and resonance. The global compacts which will flow from the New York Declaration also represent a crucial turning point offering an opportunity for states around the world to move towards ending child immigration detention and promoting alternatives to detention. For all of us, working to better protect and to find solutions for refugee and migrant children this represents a unique opportunity to strengthen existing protection systems and make more predictable new international solidarity mechanisms in ways that are informed by children's best interests, human rights and specific needs. The New York Declaration campaign contains important commitments, as we heard also from, from Sandy from UNICEF, important commitments towards strengthening children's rights, commitments such as ending immigration detention, preventing and reducing statelessness, including through the universal documentation of children at birth, getting children into school within a few months of their arrival, ensuring access to health services, strengthening national child protection systems to benefit all children regardless of, of their legal status and finding solutions in children's best interests. UNHCR looks forward to considering the ideas that have been aired at this forum and the recommendations that will result from it and to fulfilling our commitment to ensuring that child rights are at the heart of the global compacts as well as urging states to translate the commitment to work towards ending child immigration related detention in the New York Declaration into concrete goals and targets during the negotiations ahead. Thank you very much for your attention. Many thanks, Sophie. Our next speaker is the chair of the European Network of Ombudspersons for Children, ENOC, and he is from Finland. It is uh, Thomas Kurtula. Tom <laughs> Thomas, the floor is yours. Thank you, Margaret, and, and thank you, my fellow Europeans. It's, of course, an honor to be here on behalf of ENOC, and I want to thank you for your very good cooperation with the issue during these years. Uh, still, I want to say, to be precise, that it seems that there is a big difference between law in books and law in action. What we are witnessing here today is that somehow we know what to do and precisely we know what should be the way. But on the other hand, as ombudspersons, we are witnessing from our home countries that law in books and law in action differs that much in today's Europe. And that is something to deal with the political will that we are not witnessing that much. Of course, there is great effort, but still thinking immigration detention, it is obvious and a clear issue 
that it's wrong, it's great violation of children's rights, and it shouldn't be there. But on the other hand, what we are seeing in today's Europe, that still it is there, and there is lack of that kind of a political will in our home countries and in our continent that should be there. It's a total failure of our societies when immigration and detention occurs. It is not a failure of our children, it is a failure of our societies. And as ombudspersons, we have to say that being able to monitor the issue around the Europe, we are seeing that we could do so much more. It seems that we need that kind of a program work also that needs our head of states to really say if they want to have progressive policy lines in respect to immigration and detention. Lots of talks, lots of reports are there. We are doing also our share, but the question remains what is truly law in action with our political decision makers. In general, detention is always a risk. It's a mental, social, physical risk for a child. It was really well stated, and Leon, you really said that from Hungary very well, that if we want to minimize the risk of detention, it is Article 12 from our UN Convention that we have to take seriously. It is truly a question of hearing our children, listening our children, and taking those voices seriously. My question remains today that are we hearing our children in detention? We might have some projects, we might have some research projects going on, but as we think about that kind of ongoing work that should be there with the children and Article 12, I have to say, as Ombudsperson's chair and, and from Enoch's side, that we are not witnessing that kind of progress. Hearing children is really the question of today. How we hear children in detention, how we take seriously their thoughts, their experiences. If we say that there's a risk uh, in detention in respect to mental, social and physical uh, health of a child, it is really a question of uh, hearing these children and taking these voices seriously. We need absolutely more public uh, control and monitoring mechanisms. We need that kind of uh, institutions where doors are open for all those authorities, all those people as ombudspersons who really can do independent monitoring work. If we have closed doors, it is sure that children do not know about their rights. They do not know about the rights that should be there. Monetary mechanisms, public control, is really a question in respect to detention. I have to say that those doors are still very closed indeed. Third, we need quality data. As we outlined here that we have to hear children's voices. It means that it is not a question of project. Children's lives is not a project. We need that kind of a quality data where we can truly find what they have experienced. We have witnessed from several countries how professionals from institutions, alternative care institutions, for example, truly are witnessing something that they could not understand at all after listening here in children's voices. And this is something that we are lacking that much. That kind of a cycle of research, listening, hearing children's voices, which is truly there with academic research, independent authorities who raise up those questions which are there with closed doors. These all three means that children in detention to minimize the risk is that they have to know their rights. 
It is truly the question of today that our children know their rights and we as adults take those seriously. Children in detention and in alternative care, for example, many times do not know at all their rights. They do not know the authorities they could rely on. They do not know what the legal instruments are there. Then it remains what is truly a difference between law in books and law in action. We might even say that those children outside the detention in normal life are more protected than those children in detention. And that is a severe problem for all our societies as civic societies with the societies of rule of, of law. But what about the alternatives? We have to also face the question that alternatives are not always good. Those might be weak. It is not an alternative for societies if we just say that we do not have non-institutional services and people are left alone. We are facing as ombudspersons those children whose families and parents are without services. That is not an option for detention to just say that you are left alone. And that is also a question in today's Europe. So, my friends and colleagues, in a way, we can say that there is lots of issues going on and ideas on the table. But to be precise, it is a question of political will that we want to raise up today. We can have our great seminars as we will and have our talks as we can, but what remains is the question of our governments and those decisions that they are making or not. And that is the reason why we are emphasizing the need for that kind of a policy papers also from the European Union, where our heads of states really have to say if they acknowledge the difference between law in books and law in action. Thank you. Many thanks, Thomas. And of course, there are other NELC representatives here in the room as well. So I'm sure you'll be meeting many of them tomorrow. And last but not least, um, um, Danny, as you have the, the title of being speaker number 15 this afternoon. <laughs> so it's a big cross to bear. I'm sorry about that. Um, Dani Espuras is the UN Special Rapporteur on the right of everyone to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health. It's one of the grandest UN titles I've come across. And um, Dani, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I'm very happy to join all of you today and to add some reflections, uh, messages from my experience uh, and uh, combine maybe four perspectives, historical, human rights approach, right to health approach and regional perspective and maybe a little bit of sub-regional, I mean Central Eastern Europe. Uh, the, uh, now my, it's my fourth year uh, of my rapporteurship. It's a global mandate, but I am always uh, not forgetting uh, Europe, of course, my continent, my region, and I'm not forgetting children. So I started with the reports to UN on early childhood, on adolescence. Uh, um, uh, now I had mental health, with including uh, child mental health, and I'm planning next year to have thematic reports on detention and right to health and people on the move and the uh, right to health. Uh, the um, most important, I think, is uh, uh, human rights perspective, human rights-based approach. 
it's so uh, ironical, paradoxical that this is so effective, this is like remedy, like vaccine, and it's very often sidelined, uh, left out, ignored, neglected in policies, especially in implementing policies, not so much in formulating, but in implementing. And children are, uh, are owners of their rights. I liked very much emphasis in, in this meeting on child rights approach. We need to take to have much more people on our side uh, um, explaining maybe better what does it mean a child rights approach or I should say uh, human rights of the child which is difficult even translate to some languages human rights of the child um, right to life survival and development I think it's perfect uh, article in CRC, especially not to forget the holistic development. Um, evolving capacities, um, starting from birth, and uh, it's about choices, it's about exercising freedom and uh, exercising uh, independence, autonomy, right to be from to be free from any form of violence. I want to emphasize any form of violence because, as you know, there are different attempts to uh, tolerate, to condone, to reinforce some forms of violence as if it is okay, if it is not too brutal. All forms of violence are detrimental to physical and, and mental health. Some basic principles and key messages which I try to uh, to, to put in my reports. Uh, human rights, as you know, are indivisible and interrelated. There is no hierarchy of human rights. This means, for my mandate, that, that uh, right to health is not just access to health care, uh, because when some other rights are undermined or violated, this uh, in short run or long run has detrimental impact on physical and mental health. Uh, violence needs to be addressed as a public health issue rather than, as it often happens, as we know, it is often addressed as a mad or bad issue when authorities and populations regress after some high profile case where the violence against children or between children. Uh, uh, from my uh, mandate and as a medical doctor, I emphasize that, yes, access to health care is essential, but there can be other extreme, excessive medicalization and pathologization of public health issues such as diversities, disabilities, failures of emotional, social development. They simply do not work and may be harmful. The same is about protection. What do we understand under protection? If it is, goes to un, over protection, it may be harmful. And, and this is why we talk today about the harm of detention. As we know, administrative detention, many other forms of detention are used with good intentions also for public health purposes, but there are a lot of uh, uh, evidence that they, this may threaten realization of the right to health and especially holistic development. Uh, the question also in, the air in, in this meeting is, is it possible to prevent culture and practice of violence in closed facilities, let's say in detention and institutional care, and to replace it with uh, what I would say as mental health professionals with therapeutic relationships, healthy relationship. Well, I should say in theory, yes, in practice, probably no. I, I hardly can imagine uh, you know, closed facility with, with uh, uh, no culture of, of violence. And, uh, and so this is the problem with uh, with all kind of, of, of detention. And my, my suggestion is that we should move, move towards full, full elimination of placement of children in closed in, institution. And this is time to break this vicious cycle, especially in Europe, of dependency on ineffective practices and investments that hinder realization of the right to health and holistic development for all children. 
And these basic principles equally apply to all children in vulnerable situations and for all forms of detentions, whether children with disabilities or migrant children or children of imprisoned parents. Um, I, I want to highlight uh, the um, issue of institutional care of young children. Institutional care of young children continues to be overused in European region. This failure feeds other forms of ineffective practices and investments, pays the, the way to other policy failures. And there are many deep contextual and attitudinal factors which keep this, this uh, legacy of institutional care of young children. I, I would like to, to, to remind to you that institutional care of young children creates environment of chronic neglect and toxic stress, and this is why then it amounts to institutional violence, because chronic neglect is, is a form of violence. And you probably know impressive new research on I impact of toxic stress on physical, uh, on mental, but also physical health, because we do not remember our infancy, but our, our body will remember uh, what happened in, during first years of, of life, and if the reaction to stress was ill through toxic stress, it will follow the entire rest of life, and this creates epidemics of non-communicable diseases, not to speak about uh, mental health uh, conditions. Children with disabilities need to be liberated from legacy of institutional care, and uh, we know that in many countries now it's, the institutionalization is going on, but then we hear, okay, these ch children without disabilities, okay, but children with disabilities, they will stay in institutions because they are sort of ill. This is against CRPD, but also this is, this is against um, common sense because all children need family and, and uh, it does not matter if, if child has disability or has no disability. Um, health sector, which is my, my headache, so to say, needs to integrate standards uh, set by CRPD and integrate modern policies. Maybe there are people in this room who participated in preparation and, and, and in Bucharest dec declaration. It was a very good WHO initiative on children with intellectual disabilities. I'm just concerned that it somehow faded and, and I'm not sure that there are uh, some success stories from, from countries who, who followed this. Um, so elimination of institutional care, and in my report I, I recommend to lift it from th three years to let's say five years, uh, is a very important step towards elimination of, of other forms of uh, detention. And in my report on early childhood, I, I just compiled and, and recommend all these good practices. There are a lot of them in many regions, especially in Europe. Just it, it depends on political climate, how much countries are investing in, let's say, uh, effective psychosocial interventions, which in many countries, also in the European region, are seen as a luxury. There is always hard talk in ministry how to invest not in equipment but in you know, therape therapeutic interventions to increase quality of relationships, let's say, between parents and, and, and children. Um, uh, adolescence is another critical moment, as, as we know, and we should urge everyone, all states, to provide adolescent-friendly and confidential services and to take into account evolving capacities and emerging autonomy of adolescents. Uh, this, this is a basis of good physical, mental, and, and sexual health. Uh, I address... Uh, Mm, the situation with mental health services, and I will speak more about this in parallel session tomorrow. But um, sadly, in most of countries, these services are uh, such that they violate human rights, excessively used by medical interventions, and may be harmful. And in this case, it is better to just to close them and not to keep, I mean, all kind of inpatient residential services for children and adolescents with mental health problems. 
so mental health will be more on this tomorrow. Just to, to tell that now is a moment that mental health is increasingly as a new priority and globally. Just we need to decide how to invest and how not to invest. And there are many good examples and there are still a lot of legacy of excessive medicalization, uh, pathologization and trying to fix disorders instead of I improving relationships. Uh, uh, some words about sub-regional uh, perspective, Central Eastern Europe, uh, newer, newer member states, but also non-EU, our neighbors, non-EU countries. Uh, you know, today, 100 years ago, uh, one uh, thing happened in one of countries, maybe you know, especially those from eastern part of Europe on November 7th. And interestingly, after 100 years, the, what happened in 1917 in Russia still has impact. Uh, and this, this is a lesson we all know about uh, uh, what goes wrong in, let's say, when economic social rights are, are undermined. But this was that state intervened and state told you just, uh, uh, we will take care of you, we will make you happy and healthy just we deprive you of liberty, of many liberties or freedoms. This was experiment which still we now feel legacy with all this hopelessness when we try to change uh, institutional care and many other things related with uh, children and, uh, and uh, families. So uh, I just want us to reflect this better because in Eastern, Central Eastern Europe we still need to do a lot to, to, uh, to nurture and even sometimes to protect human rights-based approach and child rights approach. Also from different kind of moral panic attacks, you know, and conspiracy theories about universal human rights principles. And this, this, this is quite serious and we, we, we need to know that this is, um, this, this, this is a threat to, to also European values. Uh, what is needed for the way forward? Human rights-based approach and evidence-based interventions should form powerful synergy. These are two very powerful tools which we uh, some should, should use just better. Human rights of the child and child rights approach should prevail over charity approach and all these setbacks which are happening now globally but also in, in in, in Europe when uh, all these universal human rights principles are under, under attacks, including so -called, by so-called um, traditional family values and other, other ineffective approaches. Ownership of a Latin spirit of CRC is needed, to, needed in throughout European region. Sometimes in eastern part of Europe, people tell, well, why should we do something what is imposed from Brussels or Geneva. It's, it's because it's needed, it's because it's effective. It's one of my, my, my responses. Leadership is needed and the role, role of civil society is crucial. NGOs may be perfect partners and leaders in effective management of change. And just to conclude, from my global mandate, I would like to say that Europe and European, European Union uh, in this not easy global climate, it has an obligation to strengthen its leadership role in promoting human rights. And the best way to demonstrate this will would be to move ahead towards elimination of this unfortunate phenomenon, which is the detention of children. Thank you very much. Many, many thanks, Danius, and I am very, very grateful to Danius for accepting to be here. We really needed that focus on access to health. Those of you who were at the side event, we all heard it come up time and again in many different ways, and I'm really glad you're here and you'll be here tomorrow. You've been really patient, 15 speeches, um, it's a big ask. Tomorrow will be a much more interactive day, of course, and you'll split into four smaller groups, and there'll be time for discussion and questions and answers. So we will close it for today. The buses will leave at 7.
or before perhaps. Um, enjoy your dinner. Please make the, the best use of networking opportunities. We will see you at half past eight. Many thanks to the interpreters. I hope you don't mind that we are a couple of minutes over. Many thanks interpreters. Thank you all. And thank you to the panellists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to our panellists. I'm very sorry for getting the panellists. Thank you very much. And to our young speakers.